Thank you so much. I'd like to call this work session of the Board of Education for March 14th to order and ask us to begin by observing a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, Martha Ramirez Ramirez will be our interpreter for tonight's meeting. Ms. Ramirez is an ESL teacher at Jordan High School and Durham School of the Arts. She is available today to provide interpreting in Spanish to anyone who needs it. Ms. Ramirez. Um, me llamo Marta Gensmer Ramirez. Estoy aquí para proveer interpretación en español a los que lo necesitan. También tengo otra compañera, Nidia Matute Lobo, que también está ayudando con la interpretación hoy. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you all. That brings us to our agenda review and approval. Are there any um, items that we need to modify today on this agenda? A second. Been moved by Mr. Anru and seconded by Mr. Kaysen that we approve the agenda as presented today. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. That brings us to item four, which is public comment. We welcome public comment at every meeting, and we welcome all who are here to bring us comment. We will, as our practice, um, listen thoughtfully, and administrators typically follow up with commenters, but we will not um, be responding today. And we will probably open up general public comment again later in the meeting if folks arrive late. So. We have two individuals signed up for public comment today. The first is Theo Bishop. <coughs> Mr. Bishop? Okay. Mr. Bishop, who is not on, on mic, said that he would like to yield his um, time today to Mr. Calloway. Brian Calloway is our second speaker. Mr. Calloway, we will um, allot six minutes for your comments today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, th this will be the uh, final time that I uh, address the board with a, a name tag around my neck. Uh, tomorrow is my last day with Durham Public Schools. And uh, as much as I would uh, like to simply leave here by chucking my deuces up, I do want to share some final thoughts um, as an employee um, and wanted to uh, first just define a couple terms. Um, I'm, I, I work on the operations side. I know nothing about the academic side and never make any kind of statements about the academic side. So uh, anything I, I do say is uh, geared towards the operational side of our, um, our endeavor here. And um, also, uh, as I may use the, the term uh, corruption, I wanted to define that as Miriam Webster does, uh, which is the uh, dishonest and illegal behavior uh, by powerful people, especially government officials and police officers won't be commenting on police officers at all tonight either, but, um, but I, did, um, I did want to say that uh, I have uh, greatly, in many ways, greatly enjoyed my time here. Uh, I live in this community. Um, public education is literally in my blood. My mother was a 34-year um, public school educator. My grandmother had 75 years of teaching experience in public schools. Uh, she was 97 years old and still driving herself to substitute school teach. Uh, the, when the opportunity presented itself, uh, when I saw that the community was requesting um, on somebody of my professional background and expertise, um, I, I left at the opportunity and was very excited to join. And we accomplished uh, quite a bit, I, I feel like, in the um, just over four years that I've been here. And uh, there are many memories I have and uh, many friendships that I, I've made uh, that will be everlasting. So um, I'm much appreciative to that. But I did want to make uh, three specific addresses uh, this evening. Um, first, uh, to you, uh, Dr. Mabanga, directly. Um, I, I do feel like, uh, especially in the face, again, of, of losing up to 900 students, it sounds like, this, this year or this coming year, uh, that you, you do represent the last hope for this district. There's a lot of shaky ground that we're on. And uh, I feel like we need, it is our, our time. And I do feel like, in many ways, you're the right man to bring us um, across the plate and, and turn this district around. And. Um, I, I first thought that when you were on your listening tour um, and you presented to, to all the uh, classified workers out at Hamlin Road and you, you called it the craziest thing how DPS promotes people who fail, that we have a history of doing so. And uh, I think that most of the workers out there, uh, we raised our eyebrows at that and said, this, 
this man gets it. We, let's see what happens. Um, but this this organization, I believe, is plagued by what um, the late Steve Jobs would would describe as a bozo explosion, which is the um, proliferation of unimaginative and unproductive um, executives within your, your organization. And we've had conversations about this, but it's something that if you do your listening tour beyond the walls of DPS, I think that the community senses that, that they're, they're not upset with their schools. They're upset mostly with the central office, with the, the, um, the hierarchy, the decision-making, the administration that's, um, that's, that's present, that they see. And we've seen that on display, especially in, in that November, uh, most recently in, no in November with the custodial equipment. Um, just, I mean, there's no other word for it but corruption, but the dishonesty, the, um, the, the contract language that was presented uh, erroneously to the board um, by, by some of your top executives. Um, and contractors were benefiting from that. And uh, those contractors, it was reported repeatedly that those contractors had been benefiting um, financially through overbilling and all kinds of other activities that were investigated, some before your time, some during your time. And uh, it's disturbing to me to see the um, lack of, of teeth that some of these investigations have. But um, I did want to, I did want to ask too that as you were, as you're here with us, that you focus not just on the achievement. You know, there's this achievement versus growth co co concept, but achievement versus sustainability is is a, a question I would like to. Um, ask that you address that the, the changes the, the the expansions that that we do see under your tenure, which I'm sure we are going to see and we'll see have already seen um, that we we find ways to build structures and systems that that outlast you and help transform this organization because we didn't we didn't get to where we are just by accident. Uh, we need structural change to get out of it. Um, and uh, to the board, I wanted to mention that I don't envy your position. You know, we, we do have uh, outside pressures from all kinds of entities, all kinds of for-profit education uh, organizations in town. Um, there certainly are gale force winds that, that we're faced with. Um, and I would say, though, if we have a weakened foundation, uh, it really compromises the integrity um, of our structure. And when it collapses, I don't know if you can blame those outside winds or the foundation and, and the lack of, of strength and integrity that it's built on. Um, so I, I know you've heard a lot behind closed doors as well, um, and I would encourage you not to just protect the institution, but be forward thinking. Look, look at how we can improve things because it's it's a rough it's a rough time for for Durham Public Schools, a rough time for public education. But please let's shore things up. Um, and um, I did want to just mention to the the workers, um, I, especially our classified workers. Um, I've seen some of the most dedicated workers and have had the, had the absolute joy and privilege, the custodians especially, we've, we've, we had a um, fantastic um, fight that they, they fought and that they won. And, um, and I look forward to uh, being a taxpayer in Durham County as the next time I address you. So um, thank you, but. Um. Thank you, Mr. Calloway. Thank you so much. So I know some folks have come in. Anyone else here for public comment? We welcome that. Come on, we appreciate it. Go ahead and when you come to the podium, if you can get out from back there. Right. Good evening, board. I'm going to get here early enough to uh, speak with a few of you privately before uh, my speech, but here goes. We can speak afterwards at some point. All right. Can you please state your name for those that might not know you, please? Of course. I'm Bill Garrity, acting president of the North Carolina Education Workers Union. First, try this again. All right. First, I'd like to thank the board and members of administration for talking with me over the last two weeks to try to work out the issue of weekly pay for all public school employees. The conversations we had sounded <coughs> respectful without being so. All I heard from you guys was how impossible it would be for you to pay 
us every week, even though the bus drivers got their pay changed from monthly to biweekly as soon as they threatened to walk out. And that it would cost $30 million. All I heard was how it can't be done rather than how it can be done, no matter how inconvenient it may be for you guys. Mr. Chairman, I remember you asking me not to equate what we're going through to slavery, and I respected that request. But I also remember last November when a porter stood at this very podium and tearfully told you that she had been forced to clock out and then go back to work for two hours every day for free. When she finally got up the courage to ask why, she was immediately fired. Now that may not be slavery, but Jim Crow was not slavery either, was it? Nobody believes that you're going to start paying us weekly just like that. We all know that we will have to take matters into our own hands. So we're now working on a plan of action. And it's not if, but when, the substitute <coughs> teachers will forget where they left their cell phones. And we're not going to tell you when it's going to happen, but you will know. That's it. Not as diplomatic as uh, Mr. Calloway's, but there it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garrity. I'm not sure if I saw, did, did Ms. Ramirez, did anyone else come in that wanted to make public comment? miembros de la junta directiva y de la administración escolar parte del de grupo de padres latinos unidos y este estamos aquí nuevamente para apoyar las, las iniciativas que están adoptando para apoyar la disciplina positiva de los estudiantes de nuestras escuelas nosotros sabemos que ustedes han analizado todos los estudios que demuestran por medio de datos las prácticas de disciplina que funcionan bien en las escuelas. Nosotros entendemos que la mayoría de estudios concluyen que en las suspensiones de la escuela no tienen ningún efecto positivo a largo plazo. Al contrario, los efectos son negativos especialmente para jóvenes de color. Por esa razón, estamos muy contentos de escuchar que ustedes están buscando la manera de reducir todo tipo de suspensiones o reasignaciones de escuela. Estamos aquí porque queremos ser parte de las soluciones. Como grupo, cuando nos sentamos a conversar acerca de estos problemas, pensamos en diferentes maneras, maneras de resolverlos. ¿En qué alternativas podrían existir en vez de las suspensiones? Por ejemplo, hemos pensado en que los estudiantes podrían hacer trabajo comunitario en la escuela en las bibliotecas del condado o con agencias comunitarias. O trabajo académico, proyectos, ensayos, investigaciones que ayudan al estudiante a entender las consecuencias de sus acciones. O nos encantaría si se cambiara el horario para New Direction y Rebound, abrir los sábados de 7 a 7.30 a 12.30, o de 3 a 7 entre semana para que los estudiantes puedan permanecer en sus clases. Todo esto es solo para compartir con ustedes que este tema nos preocupa bastante, que cuando nos reunimos nosotros conversamos acerca de posibles soluciones que realmente tengan un efecto positivo en los estudiantes de color. Nos gustaría sentarnos con ustedes en, en los comités de planeación para hablar de posibles soluciones. Mientras, mientras tanto, continuaremos siendo sus ojos y sus oídos en las escuelas, pues la buena implementación de estas iniciativas es esencial para su éxito. Nuevamente, gracias por su atención.
Good afternoon, members of the school board and school administration. We're here again to support the initiatives that are being adopted to support positive discipline of the school children in our schools. Um, we know that you have analyzed all the studies that show um, uh, the data that discipline, which discipline practices work what best in schools. Um, we understand that the majority of the studies conclude that suspensions don't have any positive effect in the long term. Um, on, in, instead, the effects tend to be negative, especially for um, children of color. For that reason, we are very um, pleased to hear that you're looking for a way to reduce um, any kind of suspensions or school reassignments. Uh, we're here because we want to be part of the solutions. Um, as a group, when we sit to talk about these problems, we think about different ways to resolve them um, and what alternatives can exist instead of suspensions. For example, we have thought that students could do um, community um, service in school, in the county library, or in um, community agencies, or they could do academic um, works, projects, um, studies, investigations that would help students to understand the consequences of their actions. Or we would um, love if they would change the schedule of New Directions and Rebounds so they would be open on Saturdays from 7.30 to 12.30 or from 3 to 7 p.m. Um, during the week so the students could stay in their classes. Um, all this is just to share with you um, that this uh, subject is concerns us a great deal, that when we meet, um, we talk about uh, possible solutions that could really have a positive effect on students of color. Uh, we would like to sit down with you on the planning committees to talk about possible solutions and meanwhile, we will continue um, being your eyes and ears in the schools um, because good implementation of these initiatives is essential um, for their success. Um, again, thank you for your attention. Permiso, puede darnos su nombre para para el nombre es Jacqueline Urbano. Gracias. Thank you. Oh, yes. Please, in the Durham way, please join us. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Jen Painter. I am an ESL teacher at Jordan High School. I'd like to share some questions and concerns about the current capacity of the co-located mental health services program to serve students who need to receive counseling in a language other than English, primarily Spanish. I'm very appreciative that DPS is prioritizing the mental health of its students with this program and that we have community agencies who are willing to partner with us in schools. I have many ESL students who would benefit from participation in this program, but at my school, it is not accessible to them. We have a wonderful therapist from Carolina Outreach who works at Jordan full-time five days a week. She is not able to work with students who need to receive therapy in Spanish. When teachers have inquired about this, it has been explained to us that the process for referrals for these students is for them to go to the Carolina Outreach office for an intake session. And then I assume that they could subsequently be served at that office. I appreciate that there is an attempt to connect these students with services, but this process often breaks down because students face obstacles with transportation, work schedules, or not having an adult to take them to appointments. It is for these reasons that they need the same in-house services that native English speaking students receive. I don't assume bad intent on the part of the service providers or the district program, but the reality is that these services are not reaching a group of students who very much need them, and it affects their success in school. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the reasons are, if the main problem is a shortage of Spanish-speaking therapists or something else about the structure of the program, such as its funding. Um, but as we come to the end of the second year of the program, I hope we can look for a way to extend these services to more students going forward. 
And I'd like to close just with an example of a student whom we would like to receive these students at Jordan. <clears throat> Excuse me. She arrived um, in the US as an unaccompanied minor this fall and she enrolled in DPS in January of 2019. Uh, prior to enrolling here, she was in detention at the border for several months. During that time, her mother passed away in her home country in Durham, she lives with extended family who are unable to take her to counseling appointments. She is simultaneously learning English, adjusting to a new culture, living with family with whom she is not close, navigating the US immigration system, and grieving the loss of her mother. And I would really love for her to be able to get more support while she is at school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Painter. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Allison Swaim. I work at Riverside High School. I teach social studies and also sheltered ESL history classes. Um, and just following up from um, what Jen um, shared, it's not just at Jordan where the services, the co-located services are not able to be offered to Spanish speaking students. Um, so at Riverside, we have hundreds of newcomer students who as primary language is not English and majority of those students speak Spanish. Um, a lot of these students are immigrants and refugees, and I was really excited when I first heard about the Code of Conduct a few years back, I think about three years ago at this point. Um, and I remember what really stuck out. One of the things that stuck out was the emphasis on um, trauma-informed training for educators and um, the co-located mental health services. Um, there's such a need in our schools, and I'm really glad that we have this program that's operating. I think it's an excellent thing and really needed. Um, and I think it's great that we've been able to collaborate with community providers on that. And I just, it's really important that all of our students can access that. Um, because I see in my classrooms, especially with the um, newcomer students, how much trauma is impacting their learning. Um, it can either make them shut down um, and just kind of shut out or act out, quote unquote, and you know, maybe exhibit behaviors that could be seen as disruptive and we're talking today about the code of conduct and I'm looking forward to hearing updates about that but I think it's really important that these students can access the services. I know that the counselors at our schools have uh, one of our guidance counselors has been asking a lot and communicating with the service provider and just here we are in for two years and it, I don't think that they've yet resolved that need so um, please look into this and I know that it would uh, I trust that you guys are gonna you know help make it happen and thank you again for offering this service. Thank you so much, Ms. Wayne. Others? Never want to cut off public comment in Durham because we learned so much, but thank you all that brought comment today. We, I know we all appreciate that and have learned a lot. Um, that brings us to item five, the board meeting minutes from February 7th. Move approval. Second. I'm moved by Mr. Lee and seconded by Ms. Fort Brown that we approve the meeting minutes from February 7, 2019. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It is unanimous. That brings us to item six, the consent items. You guys have seen these ahead of time and had a chance to review them. I read them out. The consent items include 2018-19 calendars for small specialty high schools, bond transfers and closures, phase two security vestibules, phase three security vestibules, staff development center roof replacement, and the Watts roof replacement. We'll approve all the consent items. I'll second. second. And moved by Mr. Unruh and seconded by Ms. Fort Brown that we approve all items on the consent agenda. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you to staff for the tremendous amount of work that went into those items and uh, projects that are ongoing to, to support our schools. That brings us to some exciting policy updates. <laughs> Oxymoron. Thank yes. You. Good evening, board Good evening. members, Madam Chair, Dr. Bubanga. 
you recall at the last meeting the board went over the section 1000 policies for first reading and we then the board approved them being forwarded to today for second reading just so that the public can see what these policies are I've shared this in the precis but also these are the governing principle policies so here's the listing I don't know if we can see it on the screen there we go and these are the second set uh, the set policy 1750 grievance procedure for employees is going to be pulled HR has asked to take a deeper look at that before it goes to the board for a second reading so um, at this point we are removing that from the request for approval from the board at this point and we'll bring it back once HR has had a chance to make some edits possibly to that policy are there any questions I do have a comment Tanya I got a um, question from a parent that wanted to know how they could in fact as they looked over policies make any kind of comments to to the policy or recommendations and um, I didn't know if we had a procedure for that what I said was if they would just send their their recommendation to us when we're reviewing that particular section we would take it into account I didn't know if that was yes if they would send it to me I would then include it with the any of the board comments and share it with the working group and the full board and take that into consideration when we are going over the policies when the board is going over those policies thank you with that in mind is the timeline for when we go over the policies available to the public on uh, the timeline itself it, it was included in a precis in the past but we are in the process of amending the timeline again I, I've said this a lot of times that we're going to need to tweak this to make sure that we really are being uh, doing this with integrity so um, we are going through that process and making sure that administration has enough time to look at the policies and that the board and the working groups have enough time to really consider them get those comments to administration so that we can give thoughtful responses to that and then go forward with a working group meeting that's our initial plan so we may again need to tweak that but I'm in the process of updating that um, the timeline right now provides for the board to get the three thousands but we are we had a very good meeting um, a couple of, I guess was that Monday yeah. <laughs> on Monday and just really wanting to make sure that we are um, addressing some of the concerns of the board and making sure that these policies are Durham specific I think that what we've discovered and what has been my impression is that it's going to require a little more involvement from administration because we're getting it from NCSBA and they're putting in what they think is significant for Durham but I think we've all kind of discovered that maybe it's not so we're gonna it's gonna take us a little more time we're gonna get the timeline finalized and we're gonna get through the process um, but it is gonna take a little more uh, uh, we're gonna spread it out a little bit but we will be following the timeline and when we do that I will share that with the board and it'll be available in appraises it may be something that if it's the board pleasure that we create like a policy web page yeah, so that so, folks right. can that was follow be my, my okay. question if we can you know make a section of the website so if people are interested they, they'll yes. know when we'll be generally when we'll be speaking about a certain policy group right. okay. that was that your um, question there? absolutely this, yeah, yeah we that. this is a, a unique opportunity to know that we are act actively looking at every policy we have over time period and the public knowing that can have a chance to have some input on that based on you know their their view and their lens yes I will um, I, I will talk with our IT department also to see if there may be a way to put a comment link in that web page so that they don't have to try to search for my email and they can maybe send that and then it populates to me so they can be right there on the web page and not have to a lot of times that can be a barrier to folks that they have to try to click through so we want to make sure that the access is easy so I will um, reach out to IT um, and see if we can get that done yeah, and, and also I did want to I didn't want you to feel from my comments last meeting that I was pushing for rapid timeline I, I, it should be done it should be done with everybody who needs input just as long as there is a timeline and, and okay. that we're not going back and forth yes Thank yeah, you. we will not allow it to get log jammed we do know the public is waiting anxiously for us to work through these policies I had people looking for the five thousands calling me up so we also 
took action recently on something that was going to put our policies in another format. Are we waiting for this work to be done to do that? Is no, that, that came through. Um, just, I believe I got the link for that. It hasn't gone online. I was going to, I just shared it with the superintendent and Dr. Hardy. And so just making sure I wanted them to look and see that there were any glitches. And then once they uh, kind of signed off on it, I was going to share with the board. And if the board didn't have any issues, make it live. But it looks it looks really good and the policies are all lined up and cleaned and we've got hyperlinks like if a policy references another policy you can just click on that hyperlink and go to it so it looks really good so that great great that being said i i have some nitpicky things about these which brings me to the i don't want to nitpick them but um i want to get them right um so would you rather do that offline and bring them back in a week yeah. is that okay with others i just I I think that's kind of where we are with 1750. So if that's the board's pleasure. I mean, I think we want to make sure that, again, going back, we this went really fast, and we were kind of yeah. trying to figure out the best process for it. So we didn't have a full meeting group, a working group. I mean, I'm open to whatever um, the board is thinks would be the best for the policy. So I think we can pull it off of this docket and or this um, so trial. How many, I'm sorry. how many readings we are we? Do they have? How many readings are we required? Two. Okay. If you if you want to work offline to to get those, I mean, if we have a I meeting wanna, next week. I mean, yeah, I don't want to sit here and do that if if you guys don't. I mean, have we concerns to bring. Yes, we do have yeah, some tournament, have and we do have um, really important um, issue later on that people are here for that is not policy wordsmithing. <laughs> um, so if, if you guys are okay with that, I'd, yeah, I'd like to bring these 1,000s back next do, week with just do action on the next right. meeting. Perfect. Okay. So do we need a motion to move it to action for next meeting? I consensus. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I'll, I'll just consensus. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Then that brings us to item 8A an exciting update on academic accreditation. We have lots of exciting updates <laughs> today. Good afternoon, board members. Um, this afternoon, we have several updates um, in the area of academics. Our first update is going to be for us to provide an accreditation update. I would like to introduce Ms. Jamie Stroud, who is our Director of School Innovation. She supports our Restart Schools accreditation, out of school time and summer learning, our school improvement process, and serves as the goal lead for our strategic plan. In 2017, Durham Public Schools participated in our five-year review process, and we were accredited. Tonight, we will discuss the process, provide an update on our steps to address the feedback that we received from the accreditation team. It's important to us that we make sure that we are adequately prepared for our next accreditation visit um, as part of the five-year cycle, which will be in 2022. This slide explains the definition of accreditation. In Durham, we are participating in the district process rather than the individual school process. So you have an opportunity with advanced ed to participate as a district or a cycle through schools. One of the good things about participating in the district process is, especially now, um, through the support of our board and our community, we now have a strategic plan. And the district process really means that during the visit, they're going to examine the entire school system. So they will look at our policies, our practices, programs, the learning conditions, as well as the cultural context. The intent is to see how those individual aspects work in a cohesive and a collaborative manner to ensure that we meet the needs of each and every child at each and every school in each and every classroom. School systems must meet the specific set of our criteria to be accredited. These include the advanced ed policies and standards, a commitment to continuous improvement, and quality assurance through observations and interviews with both internal and external stakeholders. At this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Stroud to discuss the advanced ed performance, our previous results, and our progress thus far. 
FAA, the accreditation process is used at all levels of education and is recognized for its ability to effectively drive student performance and continuous improvement in education. A little closer. The following, <clears throat> the following slide shows a summary of the findings from the 2017 report of the external review team. The index of education quality provides a holistic measure of overall performance based on a comprehensive set of indicators and evaluative criteria. A formative tool for improvement, it identifies areas of success as well as areas in need of focus. The index of quality is comprised of three domains, the impact of teaching and learning on student performance, the leadership capacity to govern, and the use of resources and data to support and optimize learning. The first column represents the scores assigned to DPS during the external review, and the second column represents the advanced ed network average scores. You can see that in each of the three domains, the DPS score is lower than the network average. For example, in teaching and learning impact, DPS received a score of 231.75, which is lower than the network average of 268.48. Four potential leverage points for improvement were identified in the 2017 report as strategic improvement priorities for improving student <laughs> performance and organizational effectiveness. They are to develop and implement procedures for school leaders to systematically monitor and support improvement in instructional practices, implement and monitor an instructional process in all schools, systematically collect, analyze, and act on data at targeted in <clears throat> intervals to ensure excellence and equity for all students, and design, implement, monitor, and support structures in all schools that provide each student with at least one adult advocate. Processes and strategies that address each of these areas and that are currently in place or will be in place in DPS are listed beside each priority area. For example, in the yellow area, teaching and learning coaches and full release mentors are examples of monitoring the instructional process in schools. Likewise, as noted in the green, benchmarks and common district assessments are examples of data collected at regular intervals to inform instructional improvements. Overall, the intent of this slide is to demonstrate prog progress toward the recommendations from the 2017 external review. We will provide the board with annual updates of the district's continued progress, and the next review will take place in 2022. Thank you very much for allowing us to share with you a brief update around accreditation. We want to thank the board for their commitment to the implementation of our strategic plan. We do believe that that will significantly help us in terms of our next accreditation visit. The strategic plan has provided specific allocation of human and physical resources that really demonstrate the areas that we mentioned towards the end of the slide that were recommendations from the previous accreditation visit. This time, we'll take any questions you may have. Thank you all very much. So on the um, index of quality slide, we have a, this is our score and we have the average. Is this, are our scores up or down? Like so over years, right? So do we have a trend for our, <coughs> our um, accreditations? or these scores over a period of time? I know, let's see, so this was 2017. You said the next one would be available 2022. So what's that, five, five, five years? years yeah. So do we have any other scores going back, back to just give some context of are we improving or where, where, does, where do we lie with this? Just talk about <clears throat> It's a little hard to compare because it's sort of apples and oranges because they're revamping the process so much. Even currently, 
with advanced ed, um, they haven't completely mapped out what the process will be over the next several years until we reach 2022, okay. but they are still in a change state. Um, it has completely changed from years ago when it was the collection of all these notebooks of artifacts to now something that is hopefully more meaningful, being a lot of um, feedback surveys, um, stakeholder interviews, observations of to ensure that what is happening, what is being said is happening, is actually oh. happening. So there's a whole lot of change in the system, so I don't know that comparing backward would give you something that, that you're hoping to find with that data. What we, okay. we definitely can look to see if we have the 2012 information so that you can see. I think one of the things that we did want to note is that there was some opportunity given the feedback that we received in 2017. Um, and if you look at how schools across, um, not only in North Carolina, but across the country that are going through this process, there was some opportunity when we, when you see the scores where there are these gaps between the average and where we are. Knowing that in Durham we want to be pioneers, I think it's important. I've had an opportunity to review that report pretty thoroughly and feel really good about the work that the, the board and our schools have done thus far. Wanted to make sure that you all were aware because often at the end of the accreditation visit, we're so excited to be accredited. We're not kind of peeling back the onion to see. And so wanted to make sure that we were being transparent and that we are continuing to do lots of work so that when we are, when we do go through the visit, even with the new process, we will have lots of um, things to be proud of. Okay, and just, um, and, and I apologize, uh, help me understand the, the comment that apples and oranges, and let me ask you, let me explain why I'm asking that. If the 2022 will be different, right, if, if it's, it's gonna be hard to compare, how does, how do these numbers um, inform us on how to improve if it's going to be different and how, how is that a, what's the relationship between the previous um, accreditation and where we're trying to go how does that um, inform us on what to do if we don't really understand where we need to be so the recommendations in the report, they do provide, if you'll go back, Ms. Stroud, to the slide that gives the four recommendations. So this is the place where they are really going to be looking when they are doing the visits um, in 2022. They provided us with these four big buckets to develop and implement procedures for leaders to systematically monitor and improve, okay. implement a process of in, uh, an instructional process for all schools, collect and analyze data, and implement structures. So those are the four big buckets that they're gonna be looking for in addition to making sure that we have coherence across all schools and there's a common theme. So they'll be doing, you all participated in several interviews, I'm sure, during that accreditation mm -hmm. visit. They'll interview folks that are seated in the audience, our community members, teachers, parents, that there's a theme of coherence around what we believe in Durham Public Schools that we're actually bringing to fruition the mission and vision that we have behind us. And so what they will be looking for and so what's different is some of the scoring rubrics, some of the documents that they will be using um, to collect the data, but they will be tracking on the recommendations that they gave us okay. and then how we have coherence across all of our schools. Okay, thank you. I'm so glad you said that coherence across all schools. If we could get people to understand that, that means that all children in every school need to learn at, at, at coherent levels. So we can't have people doing dilly-dally over here and somebody else doing this over here because it feels good. When they come to look at our schools, they want to make sure that we're all on the same page, moving children. Not to say that we're teaching the same lesson or that we're teaching it in the same manner, but that we're all in the same mindset and, and it, it is equitable for all children. So that's what they're going to be looking at. Now, in 2012, you know, it's nice to have the banner that stands up there, that sits up there and says we're accredited. But this lets us know that we've got work to do. 
and exactly what they said. Those things, they don't want those artifacts where we just put in the big book and everybody looks at it and, you know, we're talking all nice and everything. They know that that's what's going to happen. They're going to come in the classrooms and they're going to come and see what we're going to do. They're talking to the kids and seeing what we're going to do. So this is a, a truth-telling time. And it's also a chance for us to look microscopically at, at what it is we're doing and seeing if we're actually walking the talk. I just wanted to say that um, thank you for this work and bringing this in now and not waiting until close to the next time. Um, you know, a district gets evaluated so many different ways. For us at the voting booth, obviously, um, the public comment segment, uh, this is about evaluating processes, though. And a lot of times we, we think it's all about outcomes, but sometimes you got to figure out why the outcomes are or are not there. So I, I appreciate that, this, that, that you are taking the the strategic plan, which is very outcome-based, and matching it up with this, which is process-based. And um, it, I thought about this earlier when we were listening to public comment. I know that I'm, I'm almost certain that as, as, as the academic side, you're getting, you're getting reports from the departments about how you are internally evaluating the things that we're doing. That doesn't always come out to the public, so a lot of times we're hearing things from the public or in the streets individually that they just don't know. That, that's being evaluated. For instance, we have the um, strategic plan priority two update coming up. But those types of things come once a year in some cases or once a quarter. And so I just want to um, make sure that every, all of us involved understand that these evaluations are, are constantly happening. We may not always hear about it at the time that we that issue hits us when reality hits the road. We think about, why would they do this? Someone is, someone within DPS hopefully is looking at that. And, and it's, it's our job as a board member, our job, your job as a community to let us know when, when, there's a cro when that crosses poorly. But uh, I'm confident that, you know, when I look at the Friday reports that we get as a board, that you're constantly looking at how we're doing things. And that's a, this is an example of that. So just saying that's really important to always constantly evaluate what we're doing, but not to put everything in one bucket. It's not all about outcomes. For me, I'm more interested in these processes. So this is really helpful. Thank you. Other comments? I appreciate it. I appreciate the update, and I know that, you know, what accreditation means to me um, from observing it both here and Dr. Hardy and I sat on the teacher, uh, the Duke panel recently. It is incredibly tedious work for the team that leads it and the staff that have to uh, jump through these hoops for outsiders that want to come in and uh, score our district. And while we get great ideas for improvement, um, my heart goes to the people that are genuinely doing the work day in and day out in our community. And we are a highly accredited district, um, and we will continue for, towards continuous improvement. And I appreciate the staff that work towards that every day. So, um, and it's always good to see them leaving the accreditors, just like auditors. I'm sorry. Thank you for being here, and thank you for leaving. Um, my editorial okay others have thoughts before we move on so that brings us to item 8b thank you Ms. Stroud the multilingual resource center report Our next report is um, to provide an update on our Multilingual Resource Center. All of tonight's updates are directly connected to our strategic plan. Um, within that strategic plan, we have four core beliefs. Equity, shared responsibility, high expectations, and a child-centered approach. Also in priority four of our strategic plan, it says to strengthen school, family, and community engagement. Within this priority, there is a goal that specifically addresses strengthening participation of our families within the school. 
Both of these aspects, along with significant feedback from our internal staff, as well as our community members, contributed to our decision to create the Multilingual Resource Center. The foundational purpose of our Resource Center is to ensure that families have access to the supports needed for academic success. The Multilingual Resource Center is a direct report to the Office of Academics. The Multilingual Resource Center focuses specifically on interpretation and translation, parent and family support and engagement, community outreach, while our ESL department is focusing specifically on the academic needs of our English language learners, including curriculum, assessment, and professional development. I'm excited this evening to introduce Mr. Pablo Friedman as the interim coordinator of the Multilingual Resource Center. He has been in this role since January and is committed to providing timely support to all of our students and families. Tonight, he will share some of his specific activities within the first 60 days and some wonderings that we have regarding efficient and effective use of our resources so that we can make sure that we continue to meet the needs of our growing English language learner community. Mr. Friedman. Good afternoon, board members. Good afternoon, Dr. Hardy and Dr. Mubenga. It's my privilege to be here this afternoon, early evening, and present the 60-day report. When I think of the Multilingual Resource Center and the vision for our Multilingual Resource Center, we are a department that is entirely focused. Um, here we go. Do I have to push? We are a department entirely focused on student support services, and in a larger frame. I look at our work as a bridge, a bridge between the community and the schools that we are serving. So what is the Multilingual Resource Center? Here's how I would describe some of our core functions. Interpretation, which is oral. Translation, which is written. Parent and family engagement. And community outreach. Sixty days seems like a lot of time, but in actuality, when you get down to the work, it's very little time. In the last 60 days, I have been engaging in a listening and learning tour where I've had one-on-ones with all of my team members, various district departments, community partners, parents, guardians, and students. I've also pulled data, taking a look at where the long-term trends are and what we're seeing, as well as looking at some next steps to ensure we are providing the level of service that our students and our families require. So as I tell my team, I'm a believer in data because I think data tells a story and it's another, it's a language, it's a different way, of, it's another way of looking at things. <coughs> at the ESL Resource Center, one of the core functions there is registration and enrollment. And if we look at year over year trends, so from January 2019 to January 8, 2018, there was almost a 100% increase in terms of month, month to year year-to-year -year enrollments. If we look at February of 2019 to, to February 2018, we've had over 50 percent increase. And what the number for February doesn't capture is the number of pre-registrations as the, as the ESL Resource Center makes a greater push to register students earlier as part of an overall district emphasis on registering students at an earlier time period, which traditionally had happened much later in the school year. So the Multilingual Resource Center supports students, not just, English, not just Spanish speaking students, but students whose language, whatever their language needs are. And when we look at the data for the school district, so as of March 5th, 2019, we are about 8,900, 8,944 students whose home language is Spanish, followed by Arabic, followed by Swahili, Key Swahili, followed by Mandarin Chinese, followed by Vietnamese, followed by Tagalog Filipino, followed by Hindi, Urdu, and followed by Pashto. If you're wondering why there's asterisks there, I'd like to explain that briefly. The state classifies Mandarin Chinese and Chinese as two separate languages. So for the purposes of providing a more conservative number, I have combined them here. As well as the state classifies Hindi and Urdu as the same language when in actuality they're two different languages. And the state classifies Western and Eastern Pashto as two separate languages. But for the purposes of data collection, I went ahead and combined them here. It is worth noting that over the last three years, our fastest growing language in the district is Pashto. So 
So in addition to language interpretation needs, we also have translation needs. So I, we have pulled data looking chronolog or sorry, looking so over the last seven years in terms of the school district and the volume. And in particular, when we first started providing translation or when the first data measurement on, in terms of the translation team started in 2012, 2013, at a collective level, we were translating at a district. This is from English to Spanish, about 1,200, not about 1,229 documents. Last year was 2,900 and two documents, and I believe this year we're on track to exceed that, so we're probably tripling our numbers from 2012, 2013. If you'll notice, in 2015, 2016, there was this number for elementary schools, which was 2,400, and that is an enormous increase from 2014, 2015, and as well, there was a decrease the following year. And the reason for that is because that year, they were translating everything, and it was before we had put in place some practices, as well as um, enforcing some of what, uh, we had simply just translated everything that had come our way, and we started putting a little bit more guidelines into how that, what would be interpreting, and consequentially the numbers dipped from 2,400 to 2,000. So taking a look at some next steps. One of the key things that I have been hearing in my one-on-ones, particularly from parents and community partners, is the system that we have to support our families who do not speak Spanish. So I'm referring to Arabic, Swahili, Kiswahili, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Tagalog, Filipino, Hidri, Urdu, Pashto, and I've put two other languages up there, Sangho and Jarai, uh, that they would like someone that they know speaks that language that we can immediately just contract, pay them for their hours of work. And so we have our those languages internally that we can then just hire as needed. And that is a key piece of feedback that I have been hearing. It's my commitment to make sure we actually follow through with that. I mentioned Sangho and Jirai because the district has 10 Sangho interpreters, but our current our vendor that provides language support services other than uh, for any language that we want does not have a Sangho interpreter. And that was brought to my attention by a community partner. And I have also known from personal experience that that vendor does not have a Jirai interpreter. And so these are languages that students in our district speak, and we need to make sure we are supporting them. And so that's my commitment to also onboarding folks that speak those languages. So I'm still early in my transition and continuing to listen and learn. And these are some questions that I'm grappling with. I look forward to continuing to listen and learn in the next 60 days. But some of these key questions that I have on my mind right now are, do we ensure dedicated Spanish language front office staff by providing additional allotments or prioritizing bilingual candidates when vacancies occur or centralized Spanish language support service support at a dedicated and fully staffed center? Does the district continue with the role of liaisons that blend, that blend parent and family engagement and interpretation, or do we split the roles and allow for specialization, going deeper in each one? And do, currently, Spanish language support is spread across three departments, the Multilingual Resource Center, Exceptional Children, and Early Education. And do we continue with this model, or do we make changes? At this point, questions? Thank you for, for, for bringing this very thoughtful questions, and, and, and we'll certainly be looking at those um, and making those adjustments. You mentioned your team earlier. Roundly, how many people are we talking about? 10.4. <laughs> very round, thank you. Which breaks down how, Mr. Freeman? Can you remind us? Like, as far as how many are interpreters, what, what roles are those? Not, not who are yeah. they, but... So that would include folks that we have in-house that do translation. That would be our parent and fan, our parent liaisons, our community uh, liaisons. That would be some folks who also have interpreter in their title. That would be um, folks who... A receptionist position. That would be an office manager position. 40% uh, it falls into the multilingual resource center, which is why you get that point four. Um, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, so thank you. This is um, this is great. It's really helpful to to us. We know this has been a big challenge for the district for a long time. Uh, I think the move to to split out the two positions was uh, an excellent move, and thanks to the administration for making that move. Uh, 
I do have a couple of very specific questions. Uh, so the, could you put the slide up on the uh, registration? This, this one, correct? Yes. So why the jump? So that's a pretty significant jump. What, what happened? That's a great question. I don't want to speak for the team that does this. Just families continue to invest in our schools is the short answer. Okay. So it's rather than earlier identification or something or practices that have changed, it is a jump. That's or or yeah. some surge in in immigration or, uh, I mean, it just seems that's a pretty significant jump for just for people deciding that they want to. I would have to follow up with the team that's responsible for this, and I'm more than happy to provide you with an update. Thanks. Um, and then on, on translation? You, you talked <clears throat> a little bit about the big number in 2015-16, uh, and then, and, but then and all three of these kind of did a bell curve up and then down. So they continue to drop over the three years. Any sense of, of why that's happening? Is there is it because once you have some documents translated, you don't have to translate them again? Is it because I mean any any sense of what's going on there? From twenty fifteen? Yeah, so I mean twenty fifteen you were kind of explained as an outlier because we didn't have um, we're translating everything that came across. Mm -hmm. But from the next three years, it continued to uh, decline. Unless is the 2018-19 a partial year? 2018 doesn't because we haven't finished the school year yet. Ah, because this is this data point. I would argue is I get the semester ah, okay. point. Never mind. I re I withdraw the question and okay. <laughs> apologize to all my math students. Uh, <laughs> the, yeah, they are. I'll be hearing about this tonight. Um, so it is Pi Day, which makes it even more, even more, even more embarrassing. Uh, I'm really excited on, about the idea of having the the, the list of local interpreters. Um, could you, because you and I have talked about this, but could you just kind of explain to the other board members the current practice and then what you're trying to do? Because I think it's yeah. a, a really important move. So there are families, as this slide shows. Oops, excuse me. So we have families who speak Swahili, Ki Swahili, uh, Kinyarwanda, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Tui, Pashto. We have to provide services for them. So we have a vendor that we work with that bills us for the amount of hours or the amount of minutes that we use with them. Uh, it is a lot of money. It's not cheap. And I believe, based on where we're at right now, what the needs of the district are, where we want to go long term, I think we could begin to onboard folks into our the multilingual resource center that speaks some of these languages to better support our students and families. And one of the key pieces of feedback I've heard from community partners, particularly for many of the partners that work with families that speak some of these languages, they would, as opposed to talking to a phone, they would much prefer to have know who a key contact is. So that way, it's it's more seamless, it's more user friendly, and and I get it. And I think it's in that spirit that I would like to also move the multilingual resource center as well. So is your picture of how that would work? I, I, I'm, I don't think that you're proposing that we hire full-time employees in each of these languages. So they would have a contract that's, that's a local contract with somebody that would... So for, for example, in Wake County, what Wake County does is they pay their folks that are working as needed based on the number of hours that they work. So basically we would be paying, I mean, if this is the model we would like to go in, it's very similar to, for example, what Wake County does where depending on the number of hours that you worked on, and we can set up some guidelines and expectations around that, we would pay you whatever that amount is for that work. Um, yeah. Because the other part about it is, is what the current contract is, is, is a, it's, it's a lot of money. And so, so there so could be cost savings as well. So we're doing basically the same. It's the same idea, except that instead of using a contract services, we're using somebody local, and presumably we can go back to that same person, and there's a relationship over time. Correct. Right. I think that's fabulous. I'm really happy to see that. Yes. Yeah. And over time, the initial one might still be over the phone, but, but over time, presumably they, they become a person and they have a relationship. Uh, 
And then uh, the, the la my last question is on the uh, your questions. So the 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 last point there. Uh, so Spanish language support. What does that look like within exceptional children and, and early yeah. education? So. Except, uh, exceptional children has their own team of interpreters. Uh, I want to say it's five or six, I, I believe, um, interpreters who support EC students with their Spanish language needs. And the reason for that is because historically, when, for, when the ESL department first started providing parent liaisons and, and language support for parent conferences, at that time there were EC students who had needs, and those needs were not being met. And so we're talking about early 2000s here. And what, what happened is EC built out their team to meet the needs of these students, and basically those trains are, have been running for the last 19 years, and so now at a point, do we continue with that or not? And I think it's, for the purposes of transparency, I think it's important that, that the board, everyone, the public is aware because every, everyone is assuming that I am responsible for that, and the answer is no, this is where we're at as of March 14th, and this is something we're looking at. So, so if I understand it, since you're saying this is kind of a historical. Mr. Henry, I'm sorry, yeah. Dr. Hardy was chiming. Oh, Did yes, you please. get a piece of information? I, <laughs> I appreciate the question. I just wanted to add, I think one of the things that we're really trying to do in these, in these first 60 days is really try to see what the landscape is and try to help us try to think about where are the places where we can um, look at the resources and make sure that we're providing resources that are efficient. Um, and that we're using our resources, both the human and physical resources, in a manner where every family has the kind of access that they need. And, um, you know, Mr. Freeman is doing an excellent job in trying to, to figure out what some other districts are doing, some that are smaller than us, some that are larger than us, so that we can, can come back to you with some good recommendations that may, in fact, um, save the district money, but most importantly, that we make sure that we are providing the level of service that we know each and every family needs. And this is one of those places where we definitely have interpretation occurring in multiple areas. Um, and we do want to make sure that some of that specialized, when I think about what needs to occur in an IEP meeting, it's so technical. It's really important um, that we make sure that our families understand um, that the resources that we're going to be providing to the children that are receiving that IEP. At the same time, we want to make sure that level of, of service, all of our families have that. And then, thank you. That, uh, this is helpful. That, this, was, this was news to me, so I'm, uh, it's helpful to me. And then early education, what does that look like? So years ago, early education had uh, somebody that spoke Spanish and was a language support, but during the RIF, that position was removed. It was never replaced. So at this current moment, early education is essentially using the vendor to, to meet all the needs of their languages. And they're paying out, out of it, out of their own budget. And it's a, it's, it's a significant amount of money. So rather than do that through our resources, they're, they're using of, of outside vendor. Correct. Um, thank you. This is, really, this, this is very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. There are questions, yeah. comments? Yeah. Um, I actually had a couple questions. Some are a little lighter than others. So, um, what region is Pashto? Spoken? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. All right. Thank you. So, Middle Eastern. Okay. You said that was the largest, the, that's the fastest growing. Fastest growing in the district, by, in per, percentage wise, not right. in terms of aggregate numbers. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, okay. In your questions, first one, um, looks like this is uh, two options. Is it really two options or could it be both? There are many different options because I think at different points in the history of this district, we've tried to go different routes. And so I'm just putting everything that has been attempted before. Right. And I would, I would prefer we look at it as a both. You know, um, try to go that route. Um, and also, a lot of what we're speaking about here are translation services. Um, are there other services outside, you know, outside of just translation services that you guys are attempting to? I see like family engagement, um, 
other types of things. So I think the answer to that question will also be the answer to question number two. Do we can how do we can how do we envision the role of the liaisons that we currently have? Do right. we do we allow them? Do we allow both to continue in with both kind of key roles, or do we specialize? I think to your point, they're extremely important jobs that they do. I think the question is, do we continue to combine? Do, are they can do we continue as is, or do we allow for specialization? I think that's really right. the question. I think once we answer that, I think the rest is going to be fairly right. other types of services correct you know, for our students so I'm, I'm curious I love this idea I love this plan this center this uh, department um, for our students that don't speak English uh, as a primary language um, and the support that goes behind it um, do we have kind of related but parallel need um, for some of our uh, black families that are struggling that are made that are still English speakers but still having adjustment type issues you know family issues family support type issues do we have something equivalent to this and this is this isn't for necessarily for you Pablo I apologize this just happens to be in this segment I'm curious to the types of supports we might have for um, other families that are. I feel like that's an introduction to priority two, but I don't know if you were really trying to um, oh, no. to go to our next um, our next update. A couple of things. I think the first thing is um, specifically with our multilingual resource center, there is a, a truly a language access barrier. So right. some of the. Um, things that we may take for granted as English speaking and walking up into a school and being able to have a conversation, whether it's with a counselor, um, someone in co-located mental health, many of our families, um, they don't have that access. Right. And so the intention here is to make sure that that language access is not a barrier to any kind of resource that either the family or the student needs to be socially, emotionally, or academically successful. For any of our students that are having challenges that are in those same areas, we want to make sure that they have access. Um, that's one of the, the great benefits of um, our student support services in every school. So our counselors, our nurses, our social workers, our co-located mental health, and making sure that there is an advocate that can help the family or the student. Um, we do know that there are always some opportunities where we can improve to make sure that those processes happen as fast as possible. The Multilingual Resource Center, but specifically for that language access, we know that that has been a barrier. Some families um, and students have not been able to access the resources that our other families have simply because of, of the language barrier. And so that community engagement and outreach is really an attempt to make sure all of the things that we may take for granted as in terms of speaking English are accessible to right. all of our families without any barriers. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. I just received a question. Where are you located, Pablo? Staff Development Center. Thank you. So I really appreciate this update, and I know we all do. Um, I know you you may have missed public comment, Pablo, but um, Mr. Friedman, sorry, that um, we had teachers bring a concern about co-located mental health services that Dr. Hardy and I were over here talking about, um, something about the, the need for having more um, <coughs> services that are available within our schools um, that, to multilingual students. And so that's something I know that um, the district is aware of and, and working on. But as you're out, I know you're going to hear more and more um, concerns and issues, and that's why I'm so glad that you're a direct report and um, can bring the voice from the community right to um, the superintendent's office. Um, as you are working on this, are you going to look at and have you had conversations with outside stakeholders within the community like the county or um, the police department, others that might have the same kind of language needs that we might be able to collaborate or contract with as well if we come up with people that actually speak some of these more um, critical needs languages the short end the only one that is I have there has been some direct communication with is a contact from the city who's also working on some language pieces but that would be it 
I just, I imagine these are larger community issues that we might be able to, um, to share and collaborate with. Um, I can't imagine that a language line is ever as high quality as having an actual person face to face. So I know that that's something that is quality would be um, ideal if we could get to that status. And also just like in future um, reports, just to remind us that the state doesn't provide nearly enough resources for these students. It's one of my biggest pet peeves that I bring up every time we um, meet. Um, I think this group of students and the immigrants that have come to this community are incredibly underrepresented in the state allotments. And, um, and while we advocate for best practices here, um, it, it, it comes mostly with local funding and local support, I think. Um, the, the notion of immigration policies that we have put in place in Durham that, that to try to communicate safety to families, um, I would appreciate your feedback as, if you hear from, from the community about things that we need to change in policy, things that we can communicate better to make sure that families feel safe. But I know that's always our, our intent to make sure that, that families feel safe in school um, climate. You guys have other thoughts here today? Thank you so much, Mr. Freeman. I really, really appreciate it. I know everyone does. Thank you. Thank you. We are, as we will um, transition to um, item 8C, but before we do so, I know others may have come in that wanted to make public comment um, on any topic that we have on our agenda today or specifically on the strategic plan update priority two. We would welcome that at this time. If not, we will move on to that item and welcome any comments, questions, feedback uh, via email and phone calls anytime. Good evening, board members. Tonight, um, I will be joined by Dr. Julie Spencer, Dr. Laverne Maddox-Perry, and Dr. Al Royster. We also have Mr. Jerome Leathers, Principal of Southern High School of Energy and Sustainability, for our priority to update. Board members, as you know, I get excited when we have the opportunity to talk about our strategic plan. Um, tonight, we are going to be focused on priority two. Priority two is to provide a safe school environment that supports the whole child. Many of you probably remember it was really just about a year ago, almost to the day that we had our first strategic planning session at SDC. Dr. Mabinga, Mr. Key, and myself had 52 members of the community, and during that first session, we spent several hours simply focused on our beliefs. From that session, the strategic planning team identified four core beliefs, and they selected equity and a child-centered approach as two of our beliefs. Priority two in our update tonight will focus how we as a school community are working to ensure that each and every student, and particularly our students of color, are treated in an equitable manner and have access to the resources that they need to be successful, socially, emotionally, and academically. I would like to share a brief story with you before we get into the presentation. After the tragic and unexpected loss of my father, I moved with my mother over 10 hours from East Orange, New Jersey to Durham, North Carolina. I attended Pearson Town and Parkwood Elementary School and Lowe's Grove Middle School. I am seated here today because of the foundational education that I received right here in Durham Public Schools. I know that without that education, I would not have had the social and emotional skills necessary to be successful in high school and beyond. As we share this update with you, I want you to know my own personal story because it is very personal for me. 
I want every child in Durham to have the experience that I had. I was loved, I was cared for, I was challenged academically, and most importantly, I had all of the resources that I needed to be successful. Tonight, our focus will be on the goals and our benchmarks. We're gonna share with you the people, and we have a lot of community members here. We're gonna share some discipline updates, but most importantly, we're gonna discuss our progress and provide some highlights and then allow the board to have questions and discussion. For each priority, in our strategic plan, we have goals. And as you know, for each of our goals, we have benchmarks and strategies. As part of our core beliefs within the strategic plan, you know there's a clear focus on the whole child and a child-centered approach. We believe the children in Durham Public Schools deserve an educational experience that is caring and culturally responsive. We have a commitment to address the social and emotional needs of every student. The first goal in priority two demonstrates our commitment to changing the conditions in every school to address the social and emotional needs of our children. Implementation of our cultural frameworks ensures that there are the appropriate processes and structures for meeting the emotional and safety needs. This is intentionally the first goal because once implemented with fidelity, some of the outcomes include improved attendance rates for students, increased involvement in clubs and activities at schools, increased involvement in our arts and other activities, and a reduction in code of conduct infractions. Goal 2B, which is possible through the implementation of Goal 2A, indicates we will lower the number of students suspended out of school to 4% or lower. Our benchmarks for goal 2A are based on 52 schools with the exclusion of our hospital school. Our benchmark for the first year is 18 schools, indicated at 35%, and then next year, half of our schools at 26. Some examples of cultural frameworks include restorative practice, capturing kids' hearts, positive behavior and intervention supports. The strategies in this goal focus on identifying and adopting a framework and the complementary professional learning for each and every staff member to ensure high fidelity of implementation in every single school. And I just want to go back to note that within the five-year plan, we will be at 100% by 2023, which is fidelity for every single school. In addition to that, making sure that we are monitoring and gathering data from our students and staff, specifically using teacher working conditions survey information, as well as our student climate data, and disaggregating that so we're using that as a strategy to support what we're doing with Goal 2A. Goal 2B states that we will reduce our suspension rate to 4% or lower. Our baseline data in 2016-17 was 8.44% overall. However, it was 17.18% for black males and 6.14% for Hispanic males. Our benchmark for this year is 7.4%. Strategies in 2B include identifying practices that are producing disproportionate rates implementing structures and processes that systematically dismantle the inequities that occur, provide the appropriate professional learning to our staff, and that we monitor disaggregated data for each of our schools. We have lots of team members that are here and it always gives me excited to highlight the work of our team and the collaboration that's occurring. Um, as I call your name, I would like for our team members to stand. Our leads include Dr. Laverne Maddox-Perry, Senior Executive Director of Support Services, Dr. Christopher Soto, Coordinator of Social, Emotional, and Mental Health, 
Dr. Kelvin Bullock, Executive Director of Equity Affairs, Dr. Al Royster, Director for Prevention and Intervention in Student Services. Gold team members include Jermaine Porter, Matt Hunt, Laura Saldivera, Tamika Ward Satterfield, Mina Fort, James Futrell, Krista Saunders, and Dr. Monique Link. In addition to the team members that have been working um, on the implementation of Priority 2, I think it's important to note that we have collaborated to gather input from our principals, assistant principals, restorative practice center coordinators, teachers, counselors, and social workers. It's also important to note we have received significant input from a number of our community members, and I see many of them in the audience. It is important that we note that this is a collaborative effort, both internally and externally. We are making sure that we are open to gathering feedback all along the way because that will ensure implementation of priority to different outcomes from our children and meeting all of our strategic plan goals. Before we transition into the data section, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about systemic changes. Many of you have had the opportunity to participate in racial equity training and groundwater <laughs> professional learning. During these sessions, they often discuss the fish and the lake analogy. The lake represents the conditions. The lake represents the conditions of the system. And the conditions of the system must be conducive for all of the fish to thrive. The fish represent our students. Often in this work, you will hear schools and school districts that are simply focused on what we would say are just fish strategies. One example could be mentoring. We would want all black males to have a mentor. This is an important strategy, and we want to note that mentors make an exceptional difference and we know that they would help many of our black males. However, if we want to address structural racism, we must not only implement those types of strategies, but we must implement lake strategies. Our school board, our community, you all have been a leader in this effort and you see the policy changes that are on the screen. Our code of conduct and reassignment for students who are long-term suspended allocation of human and physical resources and the structure of our central office, such as our executive director of equity affairs and positions within student services, changing our in-school suspension to restorative practice centers, and specific processes that impact our pre-K through second grade students. These are examples of lake strategies, systemic chat strategies that change the condition that we need to for our students. I think we also have to recognize that when you implement these systemic changes, it takes time because they are just that, systemic changes. However, without the implementation of our systemic changes, we will not be able to dismantle the structural racism that exists. At this time, I would like to ask Dr. Julie Spencer Assistant Superintendent for Research and Accountability to provide an update regarding our student data. We're going to take a minute in our Priority 2 update to pause and look at our DPS discipline data. The data portion of this priority informs the work of this priority. And so as we look at the presentation itself is broken into two basic parts. We're going to look at some pieces that are longitudinal previous years. That is what informed the work of the priority. And then we're going to show you an update of where we are um, after first semester of this current school year. As we think about the presentation, it's organized to answer the following questions. We're going to look at how and where have the number of reported discipline incidents, how have they changed, which schools, what schools are seeing significant increases and decreases, incidents, what incidents are actually occurring, 
and how do the discipline data compare across racial and demographic groups. Additionally, we provided this for the former in-school suspension as it relates to restorative practices center. We know that they are not the same. However, that is our closest point of comparison. So you're gonna see both longitudinal as well as first semester data. I also wanna point out in the packet, we provided some additional reports. Um, we knew that you as well as our community would want to see numbers for specific schools. And so embedded in the packet, and I believe there's copies available on the table, you'll find a one page summary highlights of our first semester data, as well as a first semester school school updates as it compares to last year for each school for both restorative practices compared to previously ISS, as well as short-term suspensions, as well as long-term suspensions. Then you will also see a first semester report um, with each school and the breakdown of racial demographic groups, as well as our students with disabilities. And so you will see that those include both number and percentage of students. I will say that as a group of students gets smaller, less than 10, it is a masked number for, the, um, for data confidentiality. So as we begin, let's look at question one, looking at the longitudinal trends. This slide reflects ISS numbers for the last five school years, providing the total student number of students receiving in-school suspension over each of those school years from 2014-15 through last school year. You will note that there was an increase in the school year 2016-17. That was year one of our implementation of our new code of conduct, as well as significant changes in our data collection process, a data verification process, as well as changing the actual online portal that principals and administrators entered their data. We moved to educator's handbook. <coughs> Additionally, that year, we redefined what constituted in-school suspension, and so we put specific definition um, to what was considered an in-school suspension. For the purpose of this update, although they are not the same, ISS provides the most comparable comparison for our Restorative Practices Center, so that gives you a number to look at. So those are the previous school years. And we are going to you, switch over to an update for this current school year. Should we hold questions or do you? I, I think it would, it would be helpful because I think we're gonna, we're, the way we're gonna walk through, I think we're gonna end up answering many of your questions. Okay, I just, on that slide, I thought yes. we didn't have ISS in all schools in some of those earlier years, so that also could be contributing to Correct. some of that data variation. Correct. I didn't think you said that, so uh, I'm sorry. Great. That's yeah. a great point. So as we look at this slide, this is a semester one to semester one comparison of previous years. So this is your apples to almost apples in relationship to the time period. As we look at, as you know, we now have a policy in practice, whereas students who typically receive ISS, excuse me, short-term suspension are now included in these numbers. So if they attend New Directions or Rebound program, this is included. When our students participate, they are added to the number in our Restorative Practices Center. Despite the fact that these figures are combined in the number of students in our Restorative Practice Center for this year, we're also seeing a significant decline in, this, in the number of um, referrals for Restorative Practice Center. We have almost 1,000 less referrals to our restorative practice centers in secondary schools from 37, um, 3,712 to 2,738, and also the number of referrals in elementary schools has reduced by half from 736 last year to 317 this year. So that is apples to apples, semester one over time. So let's switch gears to short-term suspension. 
Once again, you will see the increase in school year 2016-17 for the reasons we just mentioned, which was year one of our um, implementation of a new policy. And you will see that in year 17-18 that the combination of that, 5,996 out of school suspensions at the end of last school year. So where are we now after first semester? This slide reflects semester one of this school year in comparison to semester one of previous years. Semester one of this school year reflects the lowest number of suspensions that we have seen in the first semester over the last five years. Semester one of last year, we had 2,696 suspensions, short-term suspensions, 10 days or less, while this year we have 1,263 short-term suspensions. This is a decrease of 1,433 short-term suspensions for the number of students in our school, decreased by over half as it relates to the same time last year. All right, let's look at long-term suspensions, and I think it's important to remember long-term suspensions are anything over 10 days. Sometimes people often think that it's through the end of the school year, but it could be an 11-day or more suspension. So as we look at our long-term suspensions, this provides you a glimpse of the last five years for elementary and secondary. Obviously, we see mostly secondary. These are mostly middle school and high school students. And this slide reflects long-term suspension over the last five years, with 64 being the total for the last school year. And where are we this year? After first semester, you will see the decrease. This slide reflects semester one of this school year. We've seen the decrease of over 68% in the number of students who've received a long-term suspension. This, after first semester of last school year, there were 44 long-term suspensions, and after the first semester of this school year, 14. I would also point out that um, as we think about this, you also had a policy that changed that directly impacts this, and I wanted to mention that when we think about systemic, um, that the, the policies that we have definitely go right into um, the reflection of the data. So, as we think about what schools are seeing significant increases and decreases in year-over-year -year discipline incidents? And I would say, specific schools, this is a great place to refer to the handouts and reports that will give you school-by-school -school information. But as we look at the incident number changes from last, first sem last year's first semester to this year's first semester, this chart provides a summary of changes at the school level showing that about 80% of our schools have decreased or maintained the number of incidents that have led to students going to Restorative Practices Center or receiving a suspension. Remember that maintaining could be that they had zero last year and that they still have zero. And so as we think about that, that's where the handouts are gonna be very helpful to kind of identify schools. Oh, Spencer, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Since you have the word incident up here in the title, incident, with all these numbers we're looking at, um, especially the, the, um, the student numbers that we saw earlier, am I, if I get suspended in August, in the, of this past August, and then get suspended again in February, is that two incidents? or is it one incident because I'm the same person? That's a great question. So when we talk about incidents, suspensions themselves, that could be a duplicated number. When we talk about students, whether it's um, how many students or how many students in a specific group, that is unduplicated. So the student would count only one time. And you'll see um, that is actually clarified, especially in the report that shows our racial ethnic breakdown, you'll see the word unduplicated or duplicate. You can kind of see where that applies. Great question. 
So what incidents are occurring most frequently? So similarly, we are often asked, well, what are students being um, disciplined for? So this slide provides insight on the reasons for in-school suspension previously, now restorative practices center. The reasons including insubordination, truancy, disruptive behavior, fighting, inappropriate language or disrespect. You'll note that the reasons are exactly the same from last school year to this year, but you'll also note that the numbers are less frequent for this year. This is the same slide, but for short-term suspension as it relates to the reasons for incidents and fighting insubordination, disorderly conduct, disruptive behavior, inappropriate language and disrespect being the primary reasons for our short-term suspensions. You'll notice it's the same this year. There are two that are flipped in, um, in order, but you'll also note the decrease in the number overall. Uh, Dr. Spencer, <clears throat> I'm a little confused by these graphics. Here. Okay. Um, if we look at short-term suspension, we, if you look at short-term suspension right here, just the one on the left, doesn't matter. The blue, well, up there is blue. It says 81, right? Which one am I on? I mean, the uh, fighting says 81, right? Yes. And then the language disrespect is 143. Since this is Pi Day and these are pie charts, I'm a little confused about the sizes that are being represented here because this is for Steve's math students that are watching. Uh, uh, I think the sizes might be a little misrepresented here. That's why they missed those problems. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, it's cosmetic, there's numbers, it's not a big deal. But if we put this out in the public, I would like to have the It, it looks like some digits might be cut off on the right also. The 81 might be an 800 and something, is that? And the 38 Maybe. on the right might be a 380 something, and then that would make Maybe so. the pies. But yeah. I would double I would check, yeah. I hope so. But I just want to point out, that would make sense as far as the size. Um, that would make sense as far as the size is, that's correct. So yeah, just make I, sure we. I would double check. I think a number, okay. it looks like a number. Yeah, it looks like both, on both 38 and, and 81. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, I, get, I apologize for the disruption, but it's just. No, it's a very good point. We want to clarify. <laughs> We definitely want to clarify that. Go Pi Day. Yeah. Definitely want to clarify. All right, let's look at question four. How does our discipline data compare across racial and demographic groups? One of the main concerns related to suspensions and a primary reason why our community opted to have suspension rates for specific subgroups named in the strategies of goal 2B of our strategic plan was the known disproportionality that exists in our suspension rates. This data reflects multiple years of semester one ISS previously for the previous years through last school year, this year Restorative Practices Center. Let's look further at this data. So if you take, and I'm gonna to try to use my little light. So if you take the far left group, this is our all students group, you'll see that for school year 2015-16, 3.33% 3 of all students were assigned to in-school suspension. If you go to the second bar for 16-17, you'll see that 5.94. If you go to school year 2017-18, 6.51% of all students were assigned ISS. And I guess I would point out at this current moment for the school year 18-19, 4.99% of all students have been assigned and it switches to Restorative Practice Center. 
So you will see, I would just point out that you can look at this trajectory for each group of students. This is a semester one to semester one comparison. And so I guess one thing I would want to make sure you would notice is that for 1819, in every area but white male and white female, that there is a decrease. And that's for in-school suspension, now restorative practice. So switching over to short-term suspension, this chart highlights the significant reductions we are seeing in the rates in which students in different subgroups are receiving short-term suspensions as we compare semester one data over multiple years. Yet we, although we see progress, we cannot ignore that the disproportionality remains. So let's look at this slide similarly to last year and I'll do all students. In the very far left, you'll see the school year 15-16 is at 3.61. The 16-17 school year takes it to 4.56. And the next year at 4.7. And this year, the decrease to 2.62. Semester one of the previous years compared to semester one. And then you can apply that same thinking to each group of students. Hopefully, this gives you a picture of where we have been with where we are. The student services team is going to provide more insight on the goals and strategies of where we are going, as well as an update of some of the specific steps of what is happening in our schools that will continue to redefine this data for Durham Public Schools. Good afternoon, board, uh, public, administration, Dr. Mabinga, Dr. Hardy, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide um, student support services feedback as well as uh, highlights, progress, and next steps for priority two. I wanted to continue the analogy that Dr. Hardy started about the lake and the conditions. And so we've looked at data a little bit. What I want to share with you are those process things you were talking about, Mr. Kaysen, that are going to have the systemic long-lasting effects. The first slide is about uh, what we think is pivotal for, for priority two, and that is the cultural frameworks. Um, we have focused on the whole child for priority two, and we feel these are our avenue to changes for culture and ultimately climate, and it'll lead to social emotional wellness for our students and our staff. This slide shows the number of schools that identify themselves as implementing one or more frameworks. Though there is an aspect of self-identification to these frameworks, we did not list any schools for whom our goal team leads and team members could not produce empirical evidence of implementation. This includes observational data during visits, explicit unique frameworks language throughout the building, and participation in recognitions or trainings. You should note that many schools are operating through, through more than one framework. Though that sounds odd, that is not contradictory. And um, we'll share more information on where all these three frameworks intersect as we go on uh, throughout the strategic plan. Of the two, if you notice, you'll see two schools that say they have no um, cultural framework. They actually are using different types of mindfulness. And one school is actually a PBIS school that is um, embarking on improving their implementation. And they said, we just have to get it pervasive before we say that we're fully there. So they self-identified that they are uh, not quite there, but they do um, utilize aspects of that. Here, these are the frameworks that we have identified uh, utilizing our current um, um, uh, fidelity um, identifiers. So um, it is important to, to note that implementing with fidelity is pivotal for uh, goal 2A. 
and um, the information depicted here about the frameworks categorizes the schools that achieved fidelity status in one or more of the frameworks. PBIS schools are on this list because they received a state commendation through their assessment process. The Capturing Kids Heart schools are the schools uh, that are designated as having fidelity because they have met observational systems and survey data requirements that would be expected of high performing schools operating those frameworks as is the one school listed as restorative justice. The names of these schools do not represent all those schools who are emerging in terms of implementation. For example, Brogdon is a restorative justice school who's currently working on the implementation training and plan, though they are not listed here as having achieved all of the fidelity indicators. Dr. Maddox Perry, I'm yes. sorry. So again, your graph at the top doesn't, mm -hmm. to me, align with the text unless mm -hmm. there's something about those colored highlighted schools that I'm supposed to subtract. Um, I get to 22 schools if I total up PBIS, Capturing Kids Hearts. Is it? Yeah, Merrick Moore and, and Burton are there, duplicates. There are some of those ones mm -hmm. that you said that we're doing both. Perfect. Right. And that that's what the colored text is supposed to indicate. To right. That's okay. to, to highlight thank that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And blue's not showing up as well. Blue doesn't sh Right. There's a blue. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'm just getting hungry for pie over here. <laughs> this slide is um, going to answer your question about what are those indicators and what criteria are you going to use to assess fidelity of implementation of the cultural frameworks. Goal 2A, strategy 2, requires us to develop and utilize a district assessment to gauge cultural framework implementation. You, here you'll see where the goal team has done just that. Um, we've identified four primary dona domains that will serve to indicate whether or not a school is meeting the requirement for framework fidelity. Each one of these indicators have specific and measurable thresholds that must be met for key practices and outcomes. The domains are assessing specific framework practices, for example, and that will include walkthrough observations to determine the effective usage of community building circles for restorative practices, logical sequencing, and good things for capturing kids' hearts. Shared practices will include any language or practice that runs through all the frameworks. That would include greetings, affirming teacher language, and restorative um, practices. Culture and climate survey data will include key questions from the student climate survey and teacher working condition surveys. We'll look at how the school's um, stakeholders, teachers and students, are saying that about their climate. Do we really do these things? Um, and then the fourth is assessing and supporting school-based teams. That will be um, assessed using the professional development and ongoing communication about systems, the effectiveness of those systems, and each school-based team. These frameworks are essential to Durham Public Schools, building upon those bedrock actions that have allowed us to improve our overall disciplinary statistics. Dr. Al Royster, Discipline Supervisor and Student Services Director for Prevention and Intervention, will elaborate on those actions for contextual understanding of our current stand status and our future potential. Dr. Royster. Thank you. Good evening. The efforts of DPS reducing out-of-school suspensions dates further back than the start of the 2018-19 school year. It began with key stakeholders consisting of educators, administrators, and community members serving on the discipline task force to revise the DPS student code of conduct. Their efforts led to the DPS school board unanimously approving the code of conduct on February 29, 2016. Some key changes for the DPS student code of conduct consisted of creation of level disciplinary systems separated between elementary and secondary, authorization of the superintendent to develop regulations to administer policies such as behavior matrices for grades K through 5 and grades 6 through 12, and all out-of-school suspensions for students in pre-K 
kindergarten, first and second grades must be approved by the assistant superintendents for elementary. Another key policy revision to contribute to the reduction of the out-of-school suspensions was made in August of 2018 to change the language of policy 4302.2. The change indicated students must, may be temporarily assigned to an alternative program where the students can have the opportunity to complete assignments under the supervision of a certified teacher. With this language change, the expectation is for school administrators, administrators to assign all students to an alternative learning program such as New Direction Center, Rebound, or Lakeview unless an immediate safety concern exists with assigning a student. This gives students and their parent guardians the opportunity to be in a learning environment during their suspension or reassignment as opposed to being at home or in a non-learning environment. This slide summarizes the practices and strategies in place for goals 2A and 2B. For the sake of time, I will not review all the bulleted points on this slide or the next slide, but will highlight some of the practices and strategies for goals 2A and 2B. For Goal 2A, all elementary school leaders are participating in enhanced social-emotional learning professional development. Also, restorative practices training is ongoing with all restorative practices coordinators. For Goal 2B, professional development is in progress with principals and some school staff on implicit bias and analyzing disparities. By the end of the school year, all school staff will be trained. In addition, all administrators are participating in professional learning on discipline data collection reporting, suspension policy, and the district policies govern student code of conduct. A practice in place to support both goals 2A and 2B is professional development opportunities offered by the EC department and student services regarding best practices in behavior management and social emotional learning. This professional learning is being delivered to principals, school counselors, social workers, and restorative practice center coordinators during their professional learning sessions. In addition to the practices and strategies already in place, there are a number of practices and strategies that are in progress for goals 2A and 2B. For goal 2A, key data points that make up restorative framework fidelity have been determined. We are currently selecting an, an improved district-wide elementary social-emotional learning curriculum. Every school and their identified team members have participated in professional development on analysis and goal setting based on student climate survey data. Practices and strategies in place to support goals 2A and 2B are the continued efforts to transition in-school suspension spaces to restorative practices centers. On-site visits and supports have, prov have been provided to each restorative practices center in the district. This will be a continued process this year as well as years to come as we work on shifting mindsets regarding discipline in our schools from punitive to restorative. This will involve a substantial amount of professional development for educators and a collaboration with community members to achieve our desired outcomes of school environments that support the holistic development of each and every child. And now Dr. Maddox Perry will explain some of our in-place and in-progress highlights from 2A and 2B along with our next steps to show how we plan to reach our end of the year benchmarks for Priority 2. Thank you, Dr. Royster. So some highlights. Um, we have been uh, providing professional development for all our restorative practice center coordinators. The most recent was in February. We hosted a two-day workshop for restorative practice coordinators on restorative practices. Um, it was a two-day workshop in, in professional development that was facilitated by the International Institute for Restorative Practices. This was a phenomenal experience for the coordinators and we are currently making plans to have all our principals and assistant principals experience this same workshop uh, before the close of 2019. Um, our next two-day workshop will likely be held in um, April of this year. 
The next highlight is that we've uh, enhanced our social emotional learning professional development for all elementary schools. It is important to note that while all elementary schools have not yet had the full professional development around restorative practices, they have received additional support around social emotional learning. This professional development has included building knowledge around the five social emotional learning competencies and those are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. In our work on goal 2B, there has been effective and impactful professional development for principals and school staff on implicit bias, equity, and analyzing and addressing discipline disparities. Specifically, our professional development kicked off last summer as we had our leadership retreat and re-engaged principals in discussions about disproportionality in discipline. Every school at that time received data and charts that prompted them to compare their school demographics to the demographics of their students that had received in-school suspension at that time or out-of-school suspension. From there, we began to have discussions about implicit bias, developing relationships with diverse students to avoid um, behavior infractions and suspensions as a means of addressing student behavior. We have also engaged our principals in a book study about the text, Despite the Best Intentions, How Racial Inequity, excuse me, Inequality Thrives in Good Schools. This is conducted during our principals meeting since last summer, and these conversations have prompted school leaders to consider how implicit bias manifests in their schools through discipline disparities and other disproportionate outcomes. Every principal also named an equity champion for the 2018-2019 school year that has been incentivized to attend monthly professional development with the Office of Equity Affairs. They also receive support and resources from the Office of Equity Affairs, and they are learning how to engage their colleagues in conversations of equity in their schools. Goal 2A, Strategy 5, is to utilize the student climate survey data to develop school-specific strategies that support the social, emotional health and safety of students and staff. There's been a collaboration between Student Support Services, the Office of Equity Affairs, and Research and Accountability to provide guidance and space for school teams to look at disaggregated climate survey data. Many schools had been reviewing the overall climate survey information, but through this opportunity, they were able to look at what differing student groups expressed about their schooling and begin to write school improvement strategies as a result of this data. Additionally, there have been refresher sessions for administrators in school teams related to our discipline procedures and processes. Student Support Services and the Office of Equity Affairs routinely monitor discipline data at designated schools and provide support. There have been visits um, to all of our restorative practice centers, and we have provided um, evaluative feedback as well as resource and human resource supports as needed. And there is individual consultation for schools with problematic behaviors from specific students. We really help with them with the problem solving process. Um, we've tried to make way for both mutual accountability and strong support in full measure. Our next steps, um, we'll continue to select some key research-based relationship building practices that are required and consistent across all of our schools. Once again, mutual accountability and support. We'll create and uh, approve our observational forms so that they will be uh, consistent and pervasive across our schools to monitor and improve our culture and climate practices. We'll continue to create more systems to support restorative practice teams and expand restorative practices trainings to include school-based staffs on a broader scale. We will build upon the professional development that's been offered related to implicit bias and relationship building to help educators implement culturally responsive teaching. 
Additionally, we've started the process of reconvening what was formerly the Student Code of Conduct Task Force. We will continue those conversations with the Equity and Whole Child Advisory about implementation and a process for monitoring. Once again, accountability and support. We're identifying disciplinary trends and providing support for educators as well as students when it comes to looking at the information gleaned from that. We're revisiting our conversations and giving support for schools around application of the behavior matrices. And we are providing additional training for administrators and staff regarding the documentation of incidents in educators handbook so that the data that we're utilizing is accurate and we're able to assist in any ways with support. Finally, and what I'm most excited about, to make sure we are on track with both of the uh, goals, we are going to make sure that all principals and assistant principals will be trained on restorative practices by December 2019. At this time, Dr. Harney? I would like to, I think y'all can, you can keep it. Okay. Since this is our, um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank um, our community, our Priority 2 team, our board. Um, this, I know, was a more lengthy update mm -hmm. for our strategic plan priorities, um, but we really wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to share um, all of the work that has been happening. Priority 2 is the foundation of our core beliefs, specifically around equity and focusing on the whole child. We have a responsibility in Durham Public Schools to create and sustain school environments that ensure each and every child thrives daily, socially, emotionally, and academically. I believe you can state this very simply. When you know more, you are expected to do better. We are committed to partnering with our community on an ongoing basis through our Equity and Whole Child Advisory to ensure that we dismantle structural racism, eliminate the disparities within our discipline data, and create the conditions to, syst to systemically ensure that the children in Durham Public Schools, and especially our children of color, are successful. We appreciate the feedback that we have received from our community. We also have one of our principals here who is more than willing to discuss the transition that has occurred with his own restorative practice center at Southern. We have goal team members that are here. I want to thank the community members that are here. We appreciate you and your feedback and partnering with us in this work. I want to thank the board for your commitment, especially in the policy work that you have done that has allowed us to really move priority two forward. And at this time, we're open for questions and discussion. Thank you. I'd love to hear from that principal. I ain't clapping when I finish. Right? <laughs> uh, so thanks for the invite. Um, not often do we get opportunities to come and talk about our schools and the good things that we're doing. So thank you for that. And so I guess I was invited because you see a, a, a drastic decrease in where we were last year and where we are now. And so please understand that at no point in time, I or the faculty in my building are complacent with the data that we have right now. This is an ongoing job. This is a day-to-day -day work, a month-to-month, -month, and a year-to-year -year work. And so anything that we do is strategic, uh, is planned directly to support our students, to grow our students and push them on into the world to where they could be uh, productive citizens. And so when we talk about, so Mr. Leathers, what are some of the things that you're doing in your school to where your numbers are the way they are? And so it's collective. Uh, I think with uh, Dr. Maddox Perry, uh, she showed a graph up there and it's like we can't connect to one particular program that we use. We take different things uh, because at the end of the day, I think that all of the programs that we have, capturing kids' hearts, restorative practice, those are things that we should do all the time and not just for a program. So if I could start with capturing kids' hearts, you'll come into our building all, most mornings, if not every morning, and you will see our counselors lined at the entranceway greeting our students. And you'll also see them after school 
greeting our students as they leave. And sometimes I'll get there and they'll nudge me a little bit or come up after the day is over with. Sometimes in the morning, Mr. Leather, stay in your room, um, office or whatever. But I think uh, with that collective buy-in, that these are things that are unprompted for us when counselors are standing at the entrance door. So you're capturing kids' hearts, you greet your students at the door. A lot of times we have to work on ourselves as well, right? So on Mondays, I know that my days aren't the best days. So I hang in my office just a little bit in the morning time, right? And then I move out into the day. But at that point in time, our students have gotten themselves acclimated and I've gotten myself acclimated and we can really have a productive day on Monday. So with capturing kids' hearts, uh, greeting students at the door, um, proximity of redirecting, if I redirect from across the room as opposed to walking up and just having a civil conversation or, hey, let's step outside and talk about some things to reacclimate yourself back into the classroom, those things work. When you talk about restorative justice, and that, those are the things that we're using right now. And so I'm not a restorative justice school. But we use those. We use those in our restorative center. Uh, with my restorative, uh, and the titles are given because I want to say in school suspension, but I'm not. But uh, with our restorative center, our person that's there, that she has championed that room. And so she's a constant check with Mr. Leathers to say, hey, this kid is coming down here too much and we can't keep putting him. So we find other strategies. When you go into her room, it's inviting. You look at the wall, different sayings. And so, yes, our desks are in a line, but they're spaced. They're not necessarily aligned, but they're spaced out. But the thing about that is when the students are there completing their work, what you can see is you can see little sayings on the back of the desk that they're sitting behind, positive sayings. Remember, if you want the most out of life, you have to go and get it. Remember, you greet people in a positive way, you get positive energy back. And so those are the things that we do in our restorative center that I think goes a long way. When our students enter, uh, they disconnect with their cell phones and it's a it's a one on one conference or a one on one dialogue with our restorative teacher that's there. And so she gets to the meat of what's going on. It's not necessarily that we disrupted class. It could be something that happened at home over the weekend. So then you connect that with our CFST team, child and family support team. We have a school nurse and a school social worker, and they're there every day. And I don't think that I could, we could do the job without them. So a lot of times when the initial is, and Dr. Hardy, you can tell me to sit down with me, okay? okay. <laughs> and so I think at the end of the day, um, when, when it's like, it's easy to push that suspension button when a kid used some choice words towards you, but there are some other things going on. But we have to get out into the hallway. So I go over, and I hope you guys don't mind me mentioning names, but Ms. Mangum, my school social worker, and Nurse Howard, my school nurse, please work with them. Let me know what's going on. I'll come back. I'm in a different place. The child's in a different place. Then we can come to some agreement. Uh, I think relationship, relationship, relationship. And basically what I'm trying to say, everything surrounds our relationships with each other. I have to have my students respecting, understanding, and appreciating my teachers. I have to have my teachers respecting, appreciating, and understanding my students. And we have a family type atmosphere. And so I say that because in families, it's not perfect, right? We get upset with each other. But when you come back the next day, we are together and we're going to get to a common goal. And so those are the things that we practice. And so over time, it takes time. It takes time to remedy the lake. It takes time. And so once you earn that trust, because our kids come with a lot, okay? And once you earn that trust and you show that you are a building of adults that are going to be consistent, you're going to work hard towards them, and you're not going to turn your back on them, being upset and turn your back are two different things. And so that's what we operate off of. Now I can walk out of here today and our suspension rate will shoot up, right? <laughs> I hope not, I hope not, right? And, but uh, that's just, that's been five years of putting together a culture that's of respect and that's of understanding. And so when we bring teachers into the building, I get it. 
you're going to Duke University, you're going to North Carolina Central. So the content, the understanding of the knowledge is there. What type of person are you? What type of person? And so that's what we are. I could talk about some things. PBIS, we have a, a PBIS person, Mr. Howard. He's, he's sort of like a dean of students, but you know he sort of closes the gap with us and the students as far as the administrative team. Uh, we partner with the uh, restorative, uh, we partner with uh, Rebound, and uh, we have Mr. Vitris Jones that comes in every Thursday. And so what you'll see with our suspension rates over the couple, past couple of years is that these are multiple accounts of four or five students that are constantly in it. And so our multiple accounts of students that will probably be suspended, they're working with Mr. Jones, they're working with Ms. Thurman, our restorative circles. So they have every Thursday that they talk with Mr. Jones for maybe about two hours. Real positive adult in the building that can sort of help us tie up those loose ends. Um, everywhere from homework, four nights a week to let them know that we're serious about school. We read and write because you know a lot of times behaviors come from the fact that I'm not or I don't feel that I'm as successful in the classroom as my other peers. And so we try to work on that and build that. Uh, we have many sports because I look at sports not as a, a winning type of thing most times, although I love to win. But just think about it. If I add two sports that can fill maybe 15 kids of sports, that means I have 30 more kids up under some type of guideline that they have to own up to every day. So that's what sports serve for us. We celebrate. I just don't celebrate the sports. I celebrate my dance team that just won the state uh, the other day. Yeah, yeah, the other week. Yeah, thank you. I have to uh, celebrate my chorus team. They've gone off and they've received superior markings over the past week. I celebrate everybody when I can, how I can. I celebrate my teachers, a happy environment, a calm lake, a solved lake is a great lake. And so that's, that's what we do. We're still clapping, sir. Right. We're still clapping. Thank you. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm so any questions? <laughs> you stole some of my thunder. I was going to talk about it like a little bit and how just from a lens, I was going to check off these bifocals and put on my support lens and how many of our schools in the same lake are so deep in that lake that they, there's no oxygen, no sunlight getting to them. You just talked about how you took those five years and built up the bottom of that lake, and you can see the sun. And so you stole my thunder because you live in it. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Mr. Leathers. I think that was the perfect first question, Xavier, I really do. And I think um, one thing that everybody in the room and those that are watching could, could hear is just the, the importance of relationships and the complexity of, of all the um, issues surrounding students that are dealing with any um, discipline issues at the, and how many of our adults are working with them in caring ways. Let's see what questions y'all have, because I saw you writing down lots of questions and thoughts. And besides the thanks to Dr. Hardy, Dr. Royster, Dr. Spencer, and Dr. Maddox Perry, and the entire team here who have worked tirelessly um, for years on these issues um, and, are, and have brought this report both at our asking and also at the community's asking. So we want to acknowledge that as well. So yes, thank you. Uh, this is really helpful. This is very important uh, to all of us, to the to the schools, to the community. Uh, so I so I do have a number of of, of questions here. Uh, the so when you say a a research based cultural framework, are we talking specifically about those three programs? Um, yes. So right now we are talking specifically about PBIS, 
restorative practices under rest, based on restorative justice and capturing kids' hearts. Um, we do know that there are other research-based frameworks that um, some of our schools are, are working with mindfulness, responsive classrooms, Montessori Grace, and, um, and those types of things. But right now, we are working with those three so that we do have some consistency as we try to see where we are. Um, just to add to that, we, I think, um, and I think it's probably on a slide, Dr. Maddox Perry, where we have um, the strategies for 2A. Um, in this first year, we really want schools to make that selection. So we want to give schools and communities the opportunity, the time, and, to sp and the space to make that selection so that we can support them in the fidelity implementation. Because one of the things that we do know is that when that conditions we want to make sure that the conditions of the school are supporting the social and emotional learning of students so that we have to implement with fidelity. And so the first part of that is one, making the selection. We also want to give some schools, um, because we do have some schools that may want to implement too, and then how do we work with those schools to support them to do so in a manner that makes sense so that you're not compromising one aspect of the framework. Well, and that's what it did. It seems like it'd be challenging to determine fidelity, uh, and so I'll be anxious to see kind of what that, what those criteria are for doing that. And I, it was significant to me that 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 um, Mr. Leathers gave us that presentation on, on how effective uh, he's what he's doing has been at Southern, yet it's not listed as one of the schools with fidelity. So. Uh, trying to get some sense of what that actually means to be able to measure it. Uh, it's very important. You know, we, we've spent a ton of money on capturing kids' hearts, and yet, you know, according to this, only, only three of the 12 schools are doing it with fidelity. That uh, concerns me, and, and I'm glad that we're setting a standard that says you can't just put this, you can't just hang the shingle out, but you gotta do it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see it, and you know, we'll be watching to see what that actually means. Uh, I don't think that's easy to do. Uh, on the, thank you for sharing the suspension data. Uh, just a question on, the, on that data to make sure I understand. So if it, w when a student is referred to uh, the uh, New Directions or Rebound, so, for instance, when we suspended Xavier earlier, uh, so if he if he's referred to new directions, does that count as a suspension? And that, where does that show up in in our data? If they attend new direction or rebound, then it becomes an in school a restorative practices center. It counts in the restorative practice center number, not in the short term suspension. Okay, so that number would count. Unless so it does show up. Unless they, you know, it might be that they're a day home and then they go. So, um, but if they attend the new directions and rebound, it it does not count in the short term suspension. It counts in the restorative, restorative. practices. So, so, but it's going to be one of those places. Absolutely. And so, so, so if Xavier went home for the first two days and then went to rebound for three days, how does that count? Say it one more time. If they if they were home, short term home for two days. So so the you know so the suspension was five days, if, he went home for two days and can't, if three they days are rebound. out of school any then it, those days would count as the short term. But these are not days we're counting, right? These are students. Yeah let's talk about a specific one, Steve. Do you have one that you because well, yeah, so, I have the same kind of question about these reassignments of students and making sure that we're so, counting them somewhere. Yeah, so that, so that if we go up to the suspension data, so that those are numbers of students, are they not? Numbers of students, correct. Okay. So, so, so Xavier's. I love the fact that Xavier got in trouble like this. So, so Xavier is is suspended for getting in trouble with the band teacher, and he, he goes home for two days, and then he then he goes to rebound. Because my mom kicked me out. Because mom, yes, which I don't doubt. Uh, for three days. How does it show up? First of all, I want to correct myself. That is the number of incidents. 
So that is not number of students. That's number of incidents. So that is a duplicated okay, right, number. Okay, right, um, right, sorry. But, but he, he still, it's showing up one or the other, but not both those places, I assume. You know, I'm, I would need to double check that, but I, I believe that if they are out of school, short-term suspension, and um, I think it counts both. I think it's just documented as is, but I would want to clarify and make sure. I want to interrupt you, Steve, but I, I'm in trouble already. Oh, yeah, so dig, keep digging. I just want to say just anecdotally, I know a number of families who have done that, who have done both because right. they didn't quite understand what New Directions was, right. and then they realized, oh, I should go to that. Right. You know, they're like, I'm not going there. I'm, you come on home. They're like, no, you should go there. So we still, as we're implementing this, we, we still have to make sure that our community understands what those options are. Yeah. That's, that's really on the schools that are dealing with those families. Cool. So, no, thank you. That's, and so it's just a matter of, of, of understanding. It doesn't change. So the basic information from this, uh, to me, is is significant and powerful. And what we're saying is that we have uh, our students, our schools have dramatically reduced the number of students that, or the number of, of short-term suspension incidents and long-term suspension incidents. But I'm trying to understand where the reassignment policy students are and how that would be captured or not captured in this data or masked by this data. So I didn't find any numbers that indicated. Well, so, so my understanding of what you're saying is that those show up as in-school suspension or restorative practices. And are, are you talking about the reassignment of long-term suspensions? Yeah, so if you're reassigned, if you're reassigned to Lakeview, what is that? That shows up in this number. So a student that previously was long-term suspended is now assigned to Lakeview, and so that is their school assignment. And so that is the, to me, this is the slide that rep represents best the impact of that policy change. So those, so those 14 students are, are currently at Lakeview? No, these are 14 students that are not at Lakeview that, that, that are long-term suspended. There are, so those 14 students are at home. Okay, and so then, so the students that are at... That, that did not attend Lakeview. Right. So they, they were offered Lakeview, but they did not attend Lakeview. So if they're at, if they went to Lakeview, where does that show up? What, yeah, help. They would, it would reflect... Uh, it would not be reflected here. They would be reflected as a short-term suspension for those first 10 days, and then they are a student. Because your assignment is at Lakeview and you're in school. I think that has to be clear to parents. So the, I'm gonna step in and anyone can, but I'm, I'm gonna try to take us through. So um, if you'll go back to, I think the slide with, that talks about the policies. So being long-term suspended, previ our previous policy, there was more flexibility and choice. You could either be reassigned to the alternative school, um, and it was a choice if you wanted to go there. And s many students were making the choice to not to attend to the alternative school. Now students are um, assigned to the alternative school unless, as we're working with that student, there's a safety concern. So there are some students where we would not offer that because of the safety. So those students typically, and I'm looking to Dr. Maddox Perry or Dr. Royster if I get off the train, typically what happens is those students are suspended short term, so what the principal can do for up to 10 days. That is going to be captured in your short term suspension because those students were suspended. Now they may go to, um, if they are a high school student, they may go to rebound, okay, but they are sus essentially short term suspended for 10 days. Once they have then um, received their documentation that they are assigned to Lakeview, they are no longer long term suspended. So they are attending Lakeview as, as, as a student now. So they're not showing up in that 14 uh, count. Those are the students that are not attending Lakeview. They are, are long-term suspended, either did not choose to attend Lakeview or because of a safety concern, we did not assign them to Lakeview. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm gonna check the room, okay. But so, they could so be I... receiving homebound? I mean, we, that doesn't assume, or no. 
Because I'm asking many, I don't know that they're out. I'm still I'm asking, are there 14 students that are out or are, because we do a lot of homebound and other things. Yeah. So students, I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Sue and, and my executive director and director for special ed. So students that um, have an, uh, an IEP, we do have an obligation to make sure that they are receiving their particular educational services. So we would make sure if we have students that are in that category that they are receiving their services. That could be um, through a homebound teacher, but we have an obligation to meet the needs of that child's IEP. And then other students who might be in the 14, and I, I don't know the facts of the particular case, but Mike. if they're in one of the community, yeah, okay. sorry. If they're in one of the community um, programs that doesn't have a certified teacher, we don't count them as, we, we count them as long-term suspended, but, we, but there may have been an effort to facilitate their entry into one of those community programs. Um, yeah. well, so where I was trying to get to, <laughs> Uh, is that uh, this is actually pre a pretty remarkable uh, yeah. achievement uh, because you know you, you could mask one of these by shifting things around but but if all of them are down that that means that uh, that we're doing something in the schools that the community has been pushing us to do for a, n a number of years uh, and so I just I think that it's important to recognize the work that our principals and teachers are doing to achieve this because it's a lot of work that everybody's doing. You know, I think it's easy to say, well, we, we you know we're training people on restorative justice, but uh, you know I, I I've seen that and to and to do it takes a lot of time and a lot of work. And even not being where we want to be, I still think we have to salute the work that people are doing to move us forward. And, uh, and you just have to have been in a school to know how much work it takes to, to get to, to this data. Uh, so I just want to make sure that kind of the word goes from, from, uh, from us to the schools to recognize that, w that we're very aware of how much work that takes. Uh, and, and then I have one last question, which is um, kind of the flip side of this, is the safety in the school. And, uh, and it's one thing to reduce suspensions. It's not necessarily the same thing to say that, that the school is safe. Uh, are, are we, you know, we talked about gathering some data in the, in the uh, climate surveys, uh, but are we, do we have a metric on whether students feel safe, whether staff feel safe, and are we going to use that metric also to measure safety? Because suspension is, does, does not the same thing as whether the school is safe. So two things, um, and one um, we spoke to in the presentation. So we do on an annual basis give our student climate survey, and that does provide us information. There's some explicit questions around um, how students feel um, in the school. This year, most of the time we've looked at that data as an aggregate. We's all, we've also compared that data year to year to see if there are increases or decreases in particular areas. This year, with the help of our research and accountability department and student services, we just aggregated that data for every school for um, a set of questions specific to priority to um, biracial demographics and then met with student services teams, so principals, counselors from each school to go over that data to, to talk about um, what that means for groups of students in particular schools and then how to address that. And so that work um, has already occurred and they are actually implementing some strategies in our schools to address that. That will be an annual process and it's explicit in the strategic plan that we will use that student climate survey data. We are getting ready and I'm looking to Dr. Spencer, I feel like the window opens right after spring break for our staff teacher working condition survey which is um, a replica of what we give every other year across the state. 
However, we have added some questions to actually get at some of the, the pieces around safety. And in addition to that, it will be given to all employees across the district, school base and central service staff. So not just our teachers, which is the push on the opposite years when it's given by the state. So all of that, uh, that data holistically will start to give us a picture around how do our employees feel around the safety um, of our schools and then how do our students feel. And the last thing, and, and I'll look to the team in case I've forgotten something, is that at the elementary, we talked about the social and emotional curriculum. Um, we do not have restorative practice centers and coordinators in every one of our elementary schools, but we know that our, our earliest learners are dealing with lots of social and emotional issues. And we've got a great opportunity to make sure that we're providing them with, with strategies in terms of how they deal with their social and emotional needs and building relationships. And we really do see that as an opportunity to really help our earliest learners. So as they matriculate, they'll have the skills they need to kind of deal with the interactions. And we know that implementation of restorative practice, responsive classroom, um, those kinds of things, are, I mean, that truly, those are systemic changes. And when you think about what happens in a school, if the culture is conducive and safe, then kids are going to thrive not only in their classrooms, but more importantly, in terms of how they interact with others. Well, I, I would like to see that, that a metric on, on student safety be part of what we share. I, I, I know that, I remember that we said we were going to use it. Um, but I would I would like to see it as as a metric with a goal of that uh, of our schools people in our schools students and staff believing that their school is safe and having that number grow over the five years uh, as well. So I know that the the strate strategic plan is uh, is in constant evolution, and that is is something I would like to see as part of this. Since we're going to have the data anyway, to make it explicit. Uh, again, thank you very much for all this. I would just add, I think one thing that's important, having worked in this district for a number of years and with our data, I think there is a definite um, emphasis of our student climate and our discipline, looking at the whole picture, as, as you said. And so, for example, even with our student climate survey, I have to say it is a lot of manpower to administer that survey to every fifth grader, seventh grader, 11th grader, um, schools finding, of course, online, you know, using computer to do it and finding um, space in their school to, to, to provide that opportunity for our students to speak to us. But it does provide valuable information that is, that is every day what a student experiences. And it is directly aligned to the whole child. And, and so as we think about this priority, the discipline data is so important. We know that that is, is definitely a marker that we want to tra track. But I will say I think an, um, a revived emphasis on thinking about how students feel when they walk in every day and listening to that has been a very powerful piece of what um, I think in the last few weeks with our student services team that that conversation has I think opened up um, an even greater conversation and so very the data has become very real um, the student voice has become very real um, in in kind of the work of priority too. Hi, everyone. Um, I was at work earlier, so I apologize for coming in late, but Dr. Hardy and I have spent a lot of time planning for this meeting, so I've read this presentation <laughs> inside and out. But I want to say um, I'm so thankful for the work that we're doing. Uh, Dr. Mabinga, you started a little over a year ago. Dr. Hardy, you came in a little over a year ago. And like Durham is the conversations we're having around discipline are very different in a year, right? We are talking about disaggregating student climate data by school, by race. We weren't having these conversations when I joined the board. And so I know that this work will take time. Uh, Mr. Leathers talked about five years of changing the culture of a school. And I, I know that takes time, but I feel like we're full force ahead in putting the expectation out there that we're going to do this and we need you all to do it well. So thank you all also to the team who's been out and have been in schools. And I also want to say to the community who came and said we weren't satisfied with what was happening. Thank you. Right. We need that continued voice to come to the table to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm proud of the work that we're doing. I'm excited to continue to champion the work that we need to do um, to make sure that we get this right for our students. 
Yeah, so I had a couple questions. Um, we were looking at the highlights here, and I don't, you don't have to flip to this slide. Um, we were talking about the different pro professional development things happening, um, the disparity, discipline disparities. I'm curious of how we measure that success. I understand from the get-go that suspensions are down, but the percentages are about the same. Right, so the percentages of black males is still here. And you go down to white females, which is barely showing up on the graph. Now, overall, suspensions are down. That's very clear. But if we are doing professional development related to disparities, how are we measuring the success of that pro professional development? I'm curious about that. So I'll address that. Um, many of the things that we will be developing in terms of our tools to measure our success will be done in conjunction with more than one department. Right now we're working with the Office of Equity Affairs, Student Support Services that is, and we've talked a lot about how do we not just do the um, professional development and workshops. We realize that it can't be done in isolation, so all the things that we're doing with the cultural frameworks are also going to be paired. It's almost like a three-pronged stool. We're going to pair that with equity leadership directly for um, our school leaders as well as um, culturally responsive and relevant teaching practices and pe pedagogy in our classrooms. And so there is an aspect of, of pairing with our uh, CNI colleagues as well. So it is through that, those partnerships that we'll come up with what our, um, our metrics is going to be, but essentially it's going to be addressing those disparities that we know exist. We um, like to celebrate that there are fewer numbers of students being excluded from, from their schools, and we're happy about that, but we think we're going to really see the movement in um, the, dis the disproportionate disparities once we have these conversations around race and implicit bias and systemic racism and do that as a school system in a safe way that it is not about individuals who do not like students, but it's about giving ourselves tools and our own social emotional learning so we can impact students um, positively. I think the only thing that I would add, Mr. Lee, is that I, we do want to highlight that we're down, but I think we also have to recognize that as we look at this data, there are still, when I think about the incidents that students are being referred to, we know that's a place where we want to have further conversation um, with our principals, our school-based staff, as well as with our equity and whole child advisory um, as we continue to work at work on um, implementation of our code of conduct. I think we have to acknowledge we still do have some disproportionality um, and we want to be transparent in the fact that we are trending down in terms of overall, but there are still some places where we have significant work to do. And that's where the work of the folks that you see around this table, but most importantly, the folks that are in the audience, our community members, our principals and teachers are going to continue to help us with that. We'll be bringing these updates, you all know, on a regular basis. So what I am optimistic about is as we bring these updates in the future, we will continue to see that trend, but we will start to see the gap to begin to close in, in our groups of students. That's the same optimism that I have around our student achievement data, that we're continuing to move up in terms of performance, but we're also starting to see gaps close um, between uh, usually our white students, our African-American students, our white students and our students with disability, our white students and our um, English language learners. So. I want to acknowledge that we still have work. How are we going to measure that? Just the way you said it. So you all need to continue to push us so that we measure that in seeing a closing of the disproportionality that we're currently seeing. And I, I want to be clear, um, this is great work. This is great reporting. This is the type of information that we can hand out to community. You know, we can we can speak to, yeah, we're still going to, hear about the uh, the disproportionate nature of the suspensions but now you can see it and uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm echoing what Bettina said this is exactly what uh, from the time I was on the board f first got on the board that's what community's been asking for 
And I'm uh, not afraid or not ashamed to, to share this information. I just want to make sure we keep that in, um, make sure that I, we keep that in mind um, about the, disport, the, the disportion, disportionate nature of uh, uh, suspensions and that the pedagogy, the, the, the understanding of our students is going to be really important to that for me. Uh, the thing that stands out, uh, one of the things that stands out to me about the types of suspension, uh, for the reasons, you know, the disorderly conduct, insubordination, that's subjective, right? And I think that has more to do with the adult than it does with the student. Um, I, I make it a point when I visit schools to speak to students who have been suspended, you know, um, uh, I was supposed to go over Lakeview today. I didn't make it. But um, but a lot of times I'm hearing, all I said was, what? You know, or or something like that. And that was taken as a, a threatening remark. And, right, we, we hear about it from certain schools. I won't call schools out. But um, I want to make sure that there's a balance here and that um, I... <laughs> And I want to make sure that all of the teachers understand. I fully understand what you're going. I've never been. In, I've never taught, but I understand the nature of, you know, the job that you have. But we have to understand each other, like uh, Mr. Leather was saying. Mr. Leathers was saying, you know, there is respect and understanding on both sides, and that that the number. You know the the subjective nature of of these reported incident frequencies. Um, it's kind of worries me a little bit. You know, the largest, basically the largest number is, is fighting. That's understand. But the next thing is all is disorderly conduct. What does that mean? Insubordination. That can mean d different things to different people. Um, and we're we're getting suspended higher. So. Thank you all for this. I really appreciate your work. This is not, I guess when you're going into education in school, you're not saying, you're not thinking about this. You know, it's roses. I'm going to change the world. But this is, this is the real stuff. And I appreciate you guys for digging in it and taking care of it. This is the work that's changing the world, right? I mean, if we can figure out how to better educate our black boys of color and create decrease the suspensions, that's the work that changes the world. And I, we talk about racism often and people describe it as a fog, right? Like we all are living in the fog and so we think about our black boys who are going in and we all have the fog already. It's gonna take time to clear all the pre misconceptions and preconceptions that we have for all of our students of color and our white students. All of them are gonna have that and so I think you ask a really good question, how do we hold ourselves accountable and then also how do we all continue to have this conversation and don't forget because if you talk about it once then you're like oh I went to my session check but we have to continue to have the conversation every day who did you who did you talk to today who did you call on today who did you not call on today to make sure that we're all championing the work as much as we cite the disproportionality with black males we cannot forget black girls and how they're being viewed as being over sexualized and, and, and more mature than they actually are. And so we, we and, it, and it's not just with people who don't look like us. Some of us are the same thing. So the training we all have, our eyes have to be clear. So it's the learning that we have to continue to have. Thank you for all the work that you've done. It's been marvelous. I would just echo the, the thanks that have been brought. I, I do agree that this is the most detailed um, look at this um, and sharing with the community. Um, my questions go to um, the same thing um, my colleagues have pointed out, but uh, specifically shouting out and looking for someone on your group that is looking out for students with disabilities because that disproportionality continues to break my heart. Um, and, and knowing that that we, we need to have a voice for those students in, in every decision that we're making and in every work that your team does. Um, 
because those students are so vulnerable, and I'm sure you all do. Um, you know, going back to the work that we had Jacob Victor do, looking at our data, we knew that the emphasis was not on long-term suspension and a lot of days lost there. That's, that's an important look at, at suspensions, but it's really our short-term and our in-school, um, our students not being able to be in class. And I agree with Mike, some of the concerns still about what is insubordination, what is disorderly conduct, what are we using those codes for, and when is that an adult making a decision that, that primarily is just not listening and in, in solid relationship with that child. Um, so I appreciate y'all bringing matrices or anything to bear in that space, which is where the majority of these um, students are losing instructional time. And while we can do best practices for restorative centers, it's not the same as being in a classroom with your, t with your classmates and your educator right in front of you, able to answer your questions. So, um, you know, I look at, at y'all bringing us future data on how 10-day things become one-day things or how uh, a one-day, you know, becomes a half hour out to cool down and get back into the classroom. But um, ways that we really, really can say we understand what's going on now get back into where you can learn in, in the best way. Um, um, <laughs> but can you refresh my memory on what the Student Code of Conduct Task Force is now? And who, who you, you, I think you said that that work is now this group rather than the community group. I don't want to understand that and, and be clear about where this lives now. Um, I would like to respond to, to two things. I think yeah. the first thing is a little bit about our special education. So Dr. Maddox Perry, who serves as Senior Executive Director, has student services in Exceptional Children's for a couple of reasons, but knowing that that continuum of services um, you know, needs to be there for all of our, our students. And um, Ms. Krista Saunders, who is in the audience, who is um, one of our directors, um, has been a part of this work, as well as um, Dr. Bell, who's our Executive Director for um, Exceptional Children. So so that voice, we always need to make sure that voice is at the table, and I appreciate that push. Um, your other question, so one of, as we have been listening to our community, and I think it's um, only having been in Durham a little over a year, I'm, I'm starting to learn the Durham way, and I so appreciate the, the feedback because um, we can only get better when we work together. And um, I've not been to a meeting in Durham where everyone around the table wants to make sure that we're creating the conditions to support our children. And I've been in communities where that's not the case. So we have to be very thankful that we have community groups uh, and members that are really wanting to make sure that our, our kids are successful, all of our kids. So initially, the Code of Conduct Task Force was charged with developing a code of conduct with matrices and bringing that recommendation to you in a policy, and they did some excellent work. And we did bring that group back together last year to share a status update. But the reality is, is this work is not a work that's a particular task. It's ongoing work. And um, when you implement a new code of conduct, you have to continue to, to refine it to make sure that um, we are um, creating the conditions that we want to see. So we have um, changed the name to uh, uh, Equity and Whole Child Advisory intentionally to make sure that we want this group to be an advisory group that's not just one particular task, but that is gonna advise us in an ongoing manner. We've committed to meeting at a minimum three times during each semester to make sure that they are providing us with feedback. Um, we have sent invitations to um, many of the folks that were on um, the Code of Conduct Task Force, but also we have gotten some other referrals from board members and community members, and we'll have our first meeting um, next week. Um, and members of that, that task, that advisory group will have the opportunity. We know that some are really interested in digging into some of the data that we've shared, unpacking it and providing us with some recommendations. Um, and so we are really looking forward to engaging with this community 
community group. It will have lots of community members and then a handful of uh, internal folks from Durham Public Schools. And this is our, our commitment and relationship. We'll be meeting at least two times before the end of this school year. And then once the beginning of the year starts, a minimum of six times throughout the year, three each semester. And so I'm just really excited. I've had the opportunity to talk to some of the folks that are in the audience. Um, Dr. Maddox Perry has sent out the invitations. We really think that this partnership is going to continue to help us um, with this work and get different outcomes for kids. I appreciate that. I appreciate you um, learning so quickly the Durham way, which is you bring everybody to the table. And um, glad to hear that that includes that invitation and that ongoing commitment and, and so many faith leaders in that community then that were here earlier and had to leave, I know. But this is at the heart of their work as well. Um, Responsive classroom, my favorite from my child's elementary days. Does that not make a cut, or is that still possible to make the cut for a high fidelity, whatever we're calling things? Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we are not excluding because the great thing about restorative practices or these cultural frameworks is there's such intersection, and they're all meant to provide you know, staff with tools to build students' social and emotional health. And so responsive classroom is being implemented well. It just is not a part of what we were talking about, just uh, specific to the strategic plan. But we are also supporting our schools who may make that choice. Fantastic. And you guys said regular updates. When would you see this ideally coming back before us? And what? So, um, we, and I, I do think that probably um, we need to do just an overall strategic plan update. Um, in September, I brought to the board um, a calendar for the year, which allows us basically every other month at a work session to make sure that we're digging deep in a priority. And so we are committed to that. We have done a pri all of our priorities. We still have a priority five, so excited um, that that will be coming to you. And then at the end of the year, we will also um, be providing an overall update. Um, I do have some, some other things that we would like to share. We're working with our strategic plan goal leads to make sure on a more regular ongoing basis that we are providing updates um, that will be shared um, not only through our social media, but also to our website and throughout the community. So one pager documents that will share updates and priority work um, for specific priorities as well as goals. And so I will, um, work with our superintendent and our board chair to figure out when we can share that update with you so that you can kind of see on a schedule how we'll make sure that we're communicating not only to our board and internally but also um, externally as well because there is a significant amount of work for every priority and every goal that's happening and we want to make sure that we have the opportunity to share it if if the board has you know and my colleagues we could have the strategic plan on every single work session and agenda and and Nakia would be happy but I know that there's other other work that we have to talk about <laughs> we just look forward to it in, in an ongoing way as you guys see fit but I think it, I think it remains top priority for um, this board in this community so I really we really do appreciate your focus on this today um, yeah any other thoughts questions before we move on People are fading all right that brings us to, thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Oh, and there is a Boys of Color Barbershop event again. Yes, April, 9th. Oh, April yeah. 9th at 5, 5.30, 5.30 to 7 o'clock. Thank you. I couldn't see. And it's <laughs> led by the students, right, in this one? The students are talking? Yes. That, that event was so well received in the community. I know this one will be even, even better. Um, let everyone clear out, and that brings us to summary of follow-up items. So I captured um, a section on the website to work with Ms. Giovanni and Mr. Sutter regarding um, policies, um, an update to uh, the Priority 2 presentation specific to the pie graphs. There is a number cut off. I'll work with Dr. Spencer um, to get that updated and then repost, um, and then um, um, identifying a specific safety metric and so as part of priority two those were the three items that I noted um, oh mr. Bowyer stepped away he's usually my checkpoint if I miss something I think that's I think that, those are the, yeah. Yeah. yeah and if not we know where to find you I'm sure 
All right. I'll make a motion to go into closed session for the reasons stated on the agenda. <laughs> a oh, second. I'm sorry. Were you no. going to say something? No. A right. second. We have a motion on the floor to go into close uh, by Mr. Lee, seconded by Ms. Umstead to go into closed session for the reasons stated on the agenda. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you.
stress in your voice, and I was like, you know, bitch, that's happened to me. My friends are just used to a okay. reschedule something, mm-hmm. and they're like, uh, we just know. Somebody was out, and so I needed a cover for them, and I was like, Did they win? They're yeah, they won both both the games. But when we meet tomorrow, mm-hmm. it's going to be a set of circumstances, right? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> when you have a... <laughs> oh, naturally. Awesome. We're now back in open session. Dr. Mabenga. Thank you, Chairman Lee. Uh, board members, I'm here to seek your approval for the personal report as discussed at a closed session. I move approval of the personnel report for Pi Day, March 14th, uh, 2019. Second. Been moved and properly seconded that we approve the personnel report for Pi Day. 14th, 2019. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, please use the same sign. It passes unanimously. And with that, we are adjourned.